Right, um, perhaps we can crack on. Apologies from Robert Francis, who can't be with us today, but he sent me some comments on the papers, which I'll incorporate in the meeting as we go along. Um, everyone happy with the minutes? Um, matters arise. We've got two items that um, have been deferred till later. The, the report on covert and overt surveillance will come back in October, and on experts exper by experience will come back in November. I think, Paul, that's right, isn't that? In, yeah. Um, any any um, declarations of interest? No. Nope. Um, David, your report, please. Well, thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this is um, the standard report, which is updating uh, uh, colleagues on progress. Um, a number of these items are uh, regular reporting items, and some are what. Uh, the board have asked for in previous meetings, uh, the July meeting. So I'll whiz through them at speed, David, and if uh, colleagues want to stop me as I go through, then um, uh, happy to do so. So um, the first item is an update on the academy. This is one of those items that you asked for. It was particularly in relation to the detail of the work that the academy are taking forward. So there's a rather brief paragraph, but as an annex to this report, there's some further detail on the work the Academy are doing. They've currently got uh, 46 programmes which are um, uh, being delivered or in development. Uh, they, there are three curricula which cover uh, broadly corporate areas role specific, this is specifically about inspectors working in health, uh, adult social care and primary medical services, and developmental, which is the uh, broad uh, heading which has been given to management and leadership. If you were to just look at each of the annexes, what you'll see uh, against each of those three curricula headings um, in the original slide is what areas are covered in each of those curricula, and then going in to each, uh, each one and the core curricula, you can see what the course titles are, the way it's delivered, the duration uh, in days and hours, and a broad timetable. And that then repeats for the role specific. This is obviously the longer list, uh, is a mixture of instruction-led and uh, e um, e-learning. And you've got, again, a sense of the dates and the timetable for the activity. And finally, the developmental work um, on leadership, which is a combination of those leadership programmes which have been delivered uh, previously and new ones which are being added. And then the final uh, slide is the distribution of the uh, budget uh, for uh, uh, the development of our staff, uh, um, the budget that the Academy is using to provide um, uh, those courses. Um, Tracy uh, Forrester, who's led this work for us, Eileen and myself, will be very happy to meet with any board member to go through in any detail if you want more information than is provided here. And uh, we can walk you through and get a sense of what is actually out there being delivered. Uh, Andrea was saying uh, on Monday that um, her inspectors have begun uh, the programme of the adult social care role specific development on Monday. So this is now underway and being uh, rolled out. Um, I think this is a key issue for the organisation. Um, we're often told risk registers need to be about what makes you waking up early. Well, this is the one for me. Uh, this is really the one about whether the staff we've got have the skills to do the job we're asking them to do. Uh, and this is why this is absolutely central to uh, the delivery of the transformation programme uh, that we're taking forward. Um, do you want me to pause there, David, if anybody wants to come in on that one? Okay. I mean, it looks very comprehensive, and I presume we'll be getting feedback from, from staff. Um, on, on the sort of offer to go through it in more detail, because what I didn't see on here, and I know it's happening to some extent, is, is how much kind of patient, user, citizen involvement we've, we've got in, in, um, you know, in the training programme. You know, obviously, patient stories is, is one aspect, but there's all sort of, sorts of things that could potentially contribute. So I'd be very pleased and happy to sit down with someone to you know, see what's happening and maybe how things could be developed. Well, we can provide some reassurance on that. Um, uh, uh, this capacity is grown. So on the corporate induction, for instance, uh, I, I think Paul might be coming on one of these shortly, but um, 
The corporate induction, uh, um, there's a general introduction given. I then do an introduction to the organisation and um, then uh, one of the ET colleagues will then do a, a more detailed structure and then immediately after that um, it's a user of services story and that's either Emma Pullen who's now working for the academy who's uh, whose brother was abused in Winterbourne um, uh, telling her story. Um, uh, so it's either a, a live person in that sense, or uh, there'll be a story through a DVD that's uh, played in. I, I think it's a good challenge, Kay, and we need to make sure that it's in all of our programmes. And um, I, I wouldn't want to uh, be complacent about that. I think we've still got more to do on that, but um, it, it is in there at the beginning. And just to give further reassurance, um, we're specifically working with the um, National Co-Production Advisory Group and Think Local Act Personal um, to um, ensure that the kind of those voices are uh, included in the work we're doing on personalisation. Um, so uh, some of the people that you would be familiar with, Kay, are, are involved in that directly. I'm doing an induction myself at some point. If anyone wants to, you know, join me on that, they're very, very welcome to do so. Not too many all at once. It might change the dynamic, but anyway. But um, the the openness is there. Uh, um, Just one question, David. On the the Academy Road specific curriculum, the difference between the minimum durations and the maximum durations were, you know, quite sizable. I didn't really understand, you know, role specific induction for inspectors minimum duration one day, maximum duration 23 days, you know, what, you know, that's a huge difference and I just um, wasn't quite sure what to take from that really, so it's more a question, not a, not a point. Um, I think can I need help on this, uh, Michael, is uh, uh, at the end of this, process, uh, inspectors will have had up to 23 days development. It's not saying they'll get that all at once, but the way we've conceived the curricula for inspectors and the content that's there in order to get through all of that course, which is what we think is the core that people need to do that, we think each inspector will be taking up to 23 days to actually go through all of that curriculum. So it's not each course will last 23 days, but if you combine those, it will get us to 23 days. I suppose it's the minimum, which is, you know, do, can we really be comfortable that an inspector only has one day of training, but maybe I'm misreading this. So. Um, no, we can't be comfortable that you have one day, for obviously the reason in... Um, um, Perhaps it's not the most helpful way to have presented it, saying there's a minimum that we expect. Um, we do expect everybody to go through 23 days, and perhaps what we shouldn't have done is put the minimum and maximum. I think it works where you've got blended courses, where you can actually see what components of the blended course are. Perhaps on that particular one, uh, it's not a logical extension of what we're trying to say to present it in that way. I mean, Andrew, just could you give a, your impression from a, an inspector's point of view in terms of how much training they're getting? Eh? Yes, I mean, I think that um, you know, what, what, the, uh, what the page is giving us is um, kind of you know, the whole picture, and, and so it is different in, in different respects. So um, we've got um, uh, new people coming in who are having very specific inductions and support and then development with their teams, exactly as David says, which is, is extending that. Um, and uh, in terms of the um, uh, new inspection me methodology, that's building up depending on what um, a original uh, training people have had, so in, in adult social care for example, if people have done wave one and wave two training already, then they're getting a day's worth of refreshment for the new approach rollout, but if they haven't done any of that, then they're getting a full two days. Um, so so it's, it's kind of um, titrated really in terms of, uh, in responding, trying to be person-centred about the needs of the individuals um, that we're training as well as, as what we need to see um, uh, from the organisation's point of view. But the Academy has worked very well with all three inspection directorates in terms of identifying what we need and trying to make sure that we're, they're delivering on that and it's been very helpful. Uh, yeah thanks I mean th these are always presentational issues when you talk about education and training so there's a certain amount of training you need for any job but it's the culture and the way 
the on-the-job learning and experiences with the feedback loop, which is important. So, for example, on Friday, we have a, a number of inspectors coming into our GP surgery just to get a feel for what it's like uh, in general practice with the financial squeeze, which has been on for some time in a deprived area where demand is increasing. Now, I wouldn't call that training, but understanding the environment that people are inspecting will help do a number of things, which includes um, respect for the service as it is. And most people only go into general medical practice um, as patients. Uh, most of our inspectors have not worked in general practice, and therefore that will be ongoing through the year. Uh, uh, and I've just done two inspections in Cambridge where we had local medical committees coming in as well on our inspections for them to learn. So it's about learning and, and culture rather than training, I think, Michael. I think that's an excellent, absolutely excellent point. We actually we discussed just at, at the regulatory governance committee whether um, I don't think we want to, we, we thought about making it mandatory, but that certainly everybody in this building um, and perhaps at the regional offices needed to go on inspection. So that was you know what you know should be expected of colleagues um, as opposed to. Um, you know, staying in this building and never really understanding uh, what's actually happening in the field or the real challenges faced by inspectors. So I, I think Steve's point is excellent. Um, it's rather like I gave the analogy of a retailer where, you know, usually on Fridays everybody's expected in a head office to go and visit stores. And I, you know, I think it's something sort of similar. And it is a cultural, it's absolutely a cultural point that people. You know, I just don't know how many people in this building have not been on an inspection. It would be quite interesting to know. Well, give an answer to how many people have been. No, no, no but uh, just the, the, principle, the, the principle that people here ought to, be, ought to go on inspections. So I think we've been encouraging that, exactly that. Mm -hmm. um, certainly I do that every time I go and speak to a group of staff that are not inspectors, that this is the way we need to connect um, the different bits of the business. Similarly, I think it works the other way around, that I think there's a whole bunch of inspectors that need to understand analytics so that when they've got numbers in front of them. So I think it, that, that transfusion of skill across the organisation from one bit of it to the other is absolutely right, Michael. And I'd like to think that that's a culture we're trying to create. Um, I think in terms of this report, the academy has gone from a standing start to where we are now in less than nine months. And the priority is really about making sure that the inspectors that are rolling out the new inspection and their managers are good to go on that. And, um, but I think ultimately our vision for the inspection when we, uh, for the academy when we've discussed it is that this is a service that's available to all. We've already got staff saying what is the academy doing for me because the focus is on preparing inspectors ready to go. Um, but ultimately I do see that as being an e essential part of uh, what, we, what we do. I know that most inspection teams, certainly for the hospitals, have had visitors on them. And those visitors have been people from outside the organisation as well as people from inside. Um, so I think you're absolutely right. It is a culture that we need to develop, whether it, um, you know, the, 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 the tradition uh, of Fridays being a day out, not a dress down day, but a day out day, would be a good one to shift. Um, we're not there. It's the day out day, looking at what we do. But um, I think that's where we need to go. So I think the challenge is absolutely right. Um, and I, I probably just want to um, sum up as the, the person who, with David, has probably been closest to the Academy through it, it's growth to say uh, an echo absolutely what Andrea has set out in the way the Academy uh, offer uh, it has to be capable of uh, calibration across different staff groupings. 23 days uh, for an inspector who is already in post is the core offer. It's not a maximum, it's a core. Um, one of the other things to pick up on what Steve's talking about, um, that we need to uh, ensure that we build this culture of continuous learning and continuous engagement with um, the fact that we are all constantly uh, trying to get better at our jobs, is we are just uh, putting in place um, a learning management system which um, is pretty intuitive and it's to encourage people to actually manage their own learning 
um, and to work with their managers to identify what priorities are, to reflect on the learning opportunities they've had, to engage in planning for the learning opportunities they'd like to have, and that's going to be absolutely key to us as an organisation to actually build this culture of having something that people can draw upon but also add to and which is underpinned by a view about the improving the performance of the organisation. So that's really what the Academy is about and that's why it's so pleasing to see it, it moving forward now to, to move from idea into execution. Very, very quick one. I mean, I think it's terrific that you've managed to get so much up and running in such a short period of time. It's, 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 quite a, it's very impressive, I think. Um, the question would be around how effective it is as we, as we go forward in terms of um, uh, the, 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 you know, the assessment that the people who go on the, the courses have of, of the learning processes and also of, of how well they do in terms of actually absorbing the learning and, uh, and what they, how, how they advance. So I think at some point in the future, it would be useful to, to make sure we've got that kind of information as well. David, we'll carry on. Um, I, I think Paul's absolutely right, and that's a key component of what we need to do. I think it ties in with Kay's point at the beginning about feedback from staff about, is this making a difference? Part of the game is confidence. Does this make them more confident to do the job? Yeah. Um, the next two, uh, paragraphs two and three, David, are part of the regular uh, updates. Uh, in two, I'm just updating you on the flow f through of the new regulations. Um, so uh, these are being laid before the fit and proper people and the duty of candor regs are being laid in October and in the Lords. There's then a 21 day gap. Uh, there's a, a do uh, missing from that last sentence in the first paragraph, my apologies. And um, though we don't anticipate them being in until the end of November. Fundamental standards are in from the 1st of April 2015. Uh, colleagues may be aware that um, that um, the department wished to introduce some uh, ratings regulations um, uh, and they will come in from uh, the 1st of October, although Lord Hunt in the Lords has put a motion of regret on these regulations, which um, uh, could have the impact of them being annulled. Um, uh, uh, the issue is whether that is likely to happen. Uh, people have expressed the view that it won't uh, and therefore um, will proceed uh, as if they're to be implemented. But um, uh, it needs to be borne in mind that um, that could result in their annulment. And, um, and then lastly um, is the move by the department to introduce a, a display, a, a requirement to display uh, the outcome of the regulation uh, of the most recent rating in a prominent position. Um, um, those regulations will need to be consulted upon, and uh, if they're to um, come into force, they'll come into force from the 1st of April uh, 2015. Um, just linking that back to the Academy, uh, one of the days in the 23 is really to ensure that uh, all our staff are familiar with the. Uh, detail of the new regulations, and that's uh, to acquire knowledge. Uh, the other bits of the academy are to acquire the skill about what these mean in practice. Transformation update um, gives you an update on the transformation programme, uh, a bit of repetition in relation to the academy, um, and just makes a link between the new regulations and the academy, but also a, a very brief update in relation to appointments and recruitment. Uh, we do have an additional 155 uh, appointments. Those uh, colleagues are now beginning to start uh, with CQC and are coming into place. And um, targeted recruitment programmes are now in place and being developed uh, to ensure we can recruit uh, more uh, inspectors and managers and uh, analysts. Uh, on item four, the budget, you asked at the last meeting for an update in relation to the forecasting of the budget. And uh, the annex to this report is a detailed um, schedule of um, our commitments to date and the forecast towards the end of the year. Uh, the remainder of this paragraph spells that out. So as at the 31st of July, we were underspent on our total uh, budget by 4.3 million. Uh, that run rate extended to the end of the year uh, would result in uh, 
uh, an underspend of £14.2 million. However, you'll also see in the annex uh, commitments to spend £11.7 million, which will actually identify an underspend at the end of the current financial year of £2.5 million. Uh, just to emphasise um, that the um, size of the underspend will be dependent on the ability to commit that £11.7 million worth of resources. Um, the detail of those is set out on the last sheet of the annex of financial commitments. Is it worth pausing there, David, and uh, just asking, uh, given that you asked for this report, if there are any further questions? Did you have any, Paul, did you have any comments? No. 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 Okay. No. Uh, well, I'd like to hesitate to raise this because, uh, because the, um, uh, we're at a very critical point in the development of our new, new methods about to go. Um, Sort of universal, so to speak, and the, um, I'm very much behind the way we've planned out our new methods. It's much more, seems to me, more reliable, more scientific, and so on. Um, uh, so it slightly uh, pains me to say that I think it's our job as a board to also be planning the next phase of the development of our methods as a strategic exercise. Um, and uh, I, I just want some assurance that that is what we are now planning. So if you take what we've done so far, we have um, a reliance on information as collected mainly by the NHS, which we all know is rather flawed and which needs to be transformed and stepped up a, a level. We have an inspection method that relies on a sort of mass visit, which Kieran Walsh in his review said was working well, but actually that bit of it may be the bit that we should reconsider, the, the mass visit. Um, we haven't yet, I think, got to the point where we understand how to use patient experience and carer experience in care homes. I haven't given up my idea of the app which people just fill in as they walk out of the door of the care home. Um, we haven't got our science of complaints yet, which I think we, we need to know how to use compl complaints better. And then crucially, we need to know how um, at what we do fits into an embedded system of improvement within individual organisations. It's one thing to have special measures and external organisations coming in to um, aid transformation, but it's another to have the, the, the local uh, provider so picking up what we say and turning it into something that uh, uh, that makes a difference just as a matter of routine because they've got that job and they've, they've got the people who can do it. And put, if you put all of that together, that is a, another step on from what we are doing now in almost every element. Uh, and um, so I'm very much behind it. I say I hesitate to say it because it sounds critical of what we've done. I don't mean it's, I think we've, this is the right next step, but we as a board ought to be thinking the strategic question of what is the, the next step on. I think we'd all completely agree with that, but not today, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is. It wasn't a question. It was, I was asking for. I was asking for assurance that we, we you yeah. know, the, there is a danger that as a board we get preoccupied with how many inspectors we have. Um, it's important, um, but the detail of how we're doing it, whereas it's the strategic, uh, overriding issue that we need to be addressing. I mean, I, I, think I agree completely. But Paul, did you want to comment? Yeah, um, I would give you that assurance, Lou. So we uh, will lock down, when it comes to the next agenda item, the assessment framework so all the providers know how we will judge quality of care. Um, but that doesn't mean that we lock down and forget about, not the decision we would, um, how we then do all those the details. Um, so on each of your examples, yeah, absolutely we continue to develop them. The, probably the best example is the knowledge and information strategy that came to the board uh, a while ago in outline, but the whole point of that is how do you get it to be more intelligence driven? Uh, we've recruited a new head of function uh, to look specifically at the qualitative side of that, for example, because we know that even in the NHS, although we have a decent amount of uh, quantitative data, we're in much poorer shape when it comes to the qualitative side and what people are saying informally goes to your, your app. Um, and we know that right across adult social care, uh, we have to improve the quality of data. I can step through each of your ones, but to, to give the assurance, absolutely, we're thinking ahead, and we'll bring that to the board. I don't know how you quite got that from the budget, Lewis, but... Uh, <laughs> Transformation. <laughs> OK. Anyway, you, the, the, the point is absolutely noted. You know, we have, not got the per we have not got the perfect way of doing this yet, and um, we need to come back to this. So can we note it now and not... Otherwise, we'll spend the whole morning on, on that issue. But... So, can, Paul, we'll, we'll bring this back for a longer discussion at a future board meeting if we can. So, on, on, on the budget, and particularly on, on 
um, the financial commitments, page two, the financial commitments. And I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite, honestly, not quite sure how to frame this question. But I suppose um, a, 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 a cynic might say that we've got a budget underspend, and then we've got a list of things that we now want to do to address it. And if I look at, um, and I just want to sort of test that, to, because I think that's our role, is to test that, about sort of how we're planning to spend the budget. So um, it seems to me that um, looking at this list of things, the first item, the HR recruitment campaign, and the last three items, which together add up to about 5.2 million, so about half of this 11.7 that we plan to spend in the rest of the year are related directly to the fact that we haven't managed to recruit in the way that we hope to recruit, and we're going and we're redressing it. And I, I take that that's a kind of a, a corrective mechanism for an issue which has caused partly the, under, the, the, the projected underspend. The other things on this list are, on the whole, uh, each of them smaller items addressing um, specific things which are enhancements or adjustments, it seems to me, to the existing budget um, expectations. Um, I, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems to be the case. And the kind of link here with, in a way, um, Lewis's question is, if we were looking at, um, as a board, at how we wanted to spend uh, a five million underspend in order to set, to get ourselves ahead of the game um, and to, to to be well prepared for the future. Would these be the things that we wanted to spend it on? Um, and uh, and I, I I kind of think that's a, that's that's a question that that we need to be asking ourselves as as well as the question which I I take it you as an ET have been asking yourselves, which is what what do we need to do? Um, uh, 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 in order to be able to operationalise the, the, the business plan, which wasn't previously foreseen, because these are new items, if I understand it rightly, rather than uh, uh, um, existing items. So, I, as I said, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, but I just I see a long list of 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 uh, uh, um, relatively small items of expenditure, which together um, uh, put us in a position where our forecast underspend is significantly lower than it would have been. But that, for me, begs the question of how would we want to spend a forecast? How would we want to spend a forecast underspend uh, to deliver um, the best outcome for the organisation? Um, very good. I thought you framed the question absolutely as it should be framed. So uh, we don't have any, uh, and I personally don't have any problem with that. Um, just going back to Lewis's question and Paul's answer, the other thing we've done is we've grown a strategy capacity within the organisation. When we did that, people said, why are you doing that? We've done that exactly so that we haven't got everybody drawn into managing today so somebody is there to look at tomorrow. And the reason I want to make that link is I'd argue that uh, working strategy and policy to support market oversight, uh, um, increased staffing costs within strategy and policy, or as a direct consequence of because everybody in Paul's area has been all hands to the pump to get the next item on the agenda, the handbooks out, literally everybody uh, hands to the pump. I got in the lift with somebody today who's in Paul's, said, how are you? Uh, when's the baby due? Uh, how are you? And she took how are you to mean have we got the handbooks out the door, <laughs> not uh, how is she in terms of the uh, confinement, just to give you a sense of uh, how, how are you is being interpreted by people at the minute. So those investments are about making sure we've got the capacity to do today and just keep a bit back uh, in terms of the questions about where next. And um, at the dinner last night, uh, we talked about raising the bar when we got to a given standard. They're all part of what's the next move in relation to this. Some are tactical, some are strategic, and we need to unpick that. Um, I think, Anna, your, your point about um, uh, the other items. Uh, the underspending our budget is a direct response of not being able to recruit. We, we've had this conversation before. We've held a line on uh, the standard that we want to recruit for, and the easiest thing would have been to blink and not hold that line and just spend the money. It would have been a much easier way to have this conversation. We've not done that, and we're going to stand by that unless the board challenges to do something different. But uh, we'll stand by that. So I think there are some things, uh, and you're right, you've flagged them, the recruitment, the support of bank staff, uh, where we had anticipated running bank staff down in the autumn of this year, not keeping them to allow us to have that additional capacity to run through. I think we've probably got to rethink how much bank capability we need moving forward, not uh, whether we can actually run them right out in the fullness of time. 
Um, but I would argue, and it, the, these are put to you, not as a way of spending the money because it would be an embarrassment. We're not going to spend the money on what we intended it for. There's no other way of describing that. It is a way of us trying to be creative about what work needs to be undertaken to actually do what we've committed to do. The consequence of not committing, and this is a report we brought to the July meeting, is some of the things we said we would do and committed to do, we won't be able to do on the timetable. Um, what this is an attempt to do is actually get the resources which will allow us to meet as many of those commitments as we can and then secondly uh, plan what it is that we need to do. So the budget for the academy I think off the top of my head was set at £5.3 million. We do know we can get more people through the academy if we actually spent more money in the academy. The original ask from Tracy Forrester to me was for £7.8 million. We hadn't made any plans uh, on £7.8 million. We'd made plans on £5.3 million. <coughs> and at that stage, if we thought we were going to commit all of our budget, we needed to hold it at 5.3. If we're not going to commit our budget, we can expand it. So um, we can go uh, through each of these, David, and uh, I'm quite happy to do can that. I, if can I suggest that to we don't do that, actually, here? Yeah. Uh, but maybe, Paul, at the um, Audit Committee, um, you could just look at this reforecast um, and just satisfy yourself, you know, that, that you're happy with these figures. Would, be, would that be all right? Um, yeah, Michael. Uh, I think Anna's point is an extremely, um, it's an excellent point. And I think, you know, that, um, the two Davis is right that we can't go around the room sort of suggesting ways to spend the money. But I have got one suggestion, which is, um, <laughs> but and it's, I think it would be a large sum of money. I believe that the CQC's website is not fit for purpose, and obviously one of its main purposes is to allow um, prospective patients or care home users or um, uh, patients, you know, deciding on which GP practice to use. I think it is very clumsy, old-fashioned. I mean, I find it very difficult to find information on it. And I would have thought that if, you know, if we have got an underspend and also a, a priority, which I think having a modern, easy-to-use, um, you know, website is a priority, I, you know, would be keen that some of the overspend goes on that because. It is just a very bad, I think, user experience at the moment. And it's something which could, you know, not that much money could transform it, I think. I think we'd all absolutely endorse that, wouldn't we? OK. We'll take it away. Mm. Mm. Yeah, Paul. Yes, that it, it's not doing what it needs to do. It's worth saying we can't just spend the money. We have a... Um, uh, Category from ca the Cabinet Office, you can't just make a new website. So it's one of the many controls that we have in place, government has in place, over us. So I know that Chris Day has been in a lot of negotiation to try and secure us the money to do a whole series of upgrades. We're doing an upgrade programme in the background to try and make it incrementally better, but we are hamstrung by the procurement to make sure we, do. we have to go through the right hoops to do that the right way. Paul, it is so important we have a decent website. Actually, we have been talking about it for quite a long time. Yes. I, I mean, I think we must make a major fuss if, if there's a ridiculous Cabinet Office procurement procedure. It's absurd, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's helpful to have this conversation mm. in public. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> OK, would you like to...? I was just going to say, is it the right time to do the website? You know, are we... Because, you know, we're changing our model, our approach. Um, I mean, it may be that, because I know that, that sort of not that long ago it wasn't quite the right time to do it, because we probably need to change it again. So, you know, there's, there's an optimal time that we do a sort of big change to it, and we all agree it needs doing, and it's going to happen, but there's an issue about timing, so that we kind of optimise the, you know, the change, so it actually is fit for purpose <coughs> in two, three, five, ten years. Yeah. Take it away, David. The uh, message is clear. Um, I think we do agree with it. And um... All about transparency, aren't we? I mean, not to have a really good website for us is ridiculous. I mean, why do we do what we do? 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call this report Mornington Crescent in future, but anyway, um, <laughs> item five is a staff survey and um, a, a brief report uh, here um, um, in relation to progress. So I think this is a mixed picture based on the 2013 uh, survey. Um, anything that's moving by, uh, I think it was three percentage points when uh, GSK did the um, analysis back to us is not significant. Anything that's bigger than three percentage points is significant. So the overall engagement index moving from 63 to 64 is not significant. It's effectively staying the same. So that is saying our engagement uh, of staff is um, reasonably good compared to the public sector. I think the private sector benchmark is 74. So if we're comparing ourselves with the public sector, it's reasonably good. If we're comparing ourselves with the private sector, it isn't. I think we should be comparing ourselves with the best and have that ambition. What you've got is a high level uh, summary of what's up, uh, what's down in terms of numbers. Robert Francis in some written comments said uh, uh, it would be helpful to know what the top and uh, bottom areas were. So the top scoring um, areas in the survey were um, related to teamwork. The top ones were related to teamwork. My com team is committed to producing quality work, came in at 90%. I can rely on my team. I believe that CQC monitors, inspects and regulates the standards. Um, uh, my team respects and values each other. Uh, the team I work in produces effective outcomes. So very, very high scores um, uh, in relation to those. The development areas were mainly to do with morale. Um, compared, the bottom five were in this order. Compared to other people, uh, I'd, I think I'm rewarded uh, fairly. Training and development I receive is effective was 38%. Uh, the academy debate. I believe that changes are effectively implemented was 34%. I feel communication across different parts of CQC is effective 33% and morale is good was 27%. So just to uh, pull those out to uh, Robert's question of well, what was at the top and what was at the bottom, they were the top and the bottom. Uh, what we intend uh, to do with this is um, there's now a programme where each of the directorates will, through their meetings and team meetings during October and November, discuss these results. Um, each of the directorates has their own um, uh, report. Um, there are differences between directorates and, uh, and therefore the actions that may well follow from that are likely to reflect some of those differences in the way they move forward. Uh, as an executive team, uh, uh, and, and certainly I have asked that we focus on uh, the answer to the question in the survey, which said, what were the top three things which would do most to affect morale? And those three things uh, were identified as effective systems, tools and processes, uh, learning and development and staff resourcing. So uh, our view, uh, the uh, uh, board might have a view on this as well, is that they're the top three issues that we need to attack. Uh, and make sure that we do that. So I'm not looking for broad action plans which are attempting to do lots of things, but very specific action plans which are designed to attack those three areas of um, um, concern which are expressed in the survey. Is it worth pausing at that? Um, two issues. One is, um, are we actually going to publish the the staff survey, help, yes. help we publish it. We are going yes, to, yeah, but we'd like to do that alongside the action plan. So these okay, are the issues yeah. and this is what we intend to do about it. It'll, it. Be, on the, it'll be on the website. It will. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And also, <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, well, that's not very... <laughs> no. And of course, it, uh, staff will have access to it. Thank you. Uh, on the, these three main areas, um, uh, I mean, it would be useful to have a sort of mid-year update to see how, how we're doing on these, because, you know, we, we've had... 85% of our staff respond to the survey, which is, is great, you know. And I know that staff do feel listened to, but these are really quite important issues for them and for us. Um, so it would be, you know, I'd, I'd certainly appreciate it. I presume others would, uh, you know, particularly looking at these three issues, because I know they're sort of embedded in other things, but it would be good to have a real kind of focus on that so we can be clear that we are addressing it and listening to our staff. Yeah. Well, 
Michael, just wondering from your experience in the retail world, you know, this kind of um, response rate and response, how, how does that strike you? Well, I think the, the overall response rate is excellent, as David mentioned. You know, the worrying figure is, of course, the one David mentioned at the end, which is morale is good, 27%. Um, I don't think it's anything to do with retailing or insurance or whatever. Um, that is just a very low uh, rating, and you know, and it is, of course, it slightly depends on. And I, I, you know, I understand that when you, one of the questions that there is a difference between people's individual morale and what they feel about the organisation's morale, and their individual morale is higher. But even that, I think, is only. 46 percent, or I mean, Andrea mentioned it in one of her. Uh, it was 45 percent for adult social care, but it was oh, uh, it was higher across the organisation. I think it was 50 something, David. But the point about there being a difference applies across all directorates, I think, um, and certainly across the organisation, um, and quite a significant gap. OK, thank you. David, do you want to carry on? Sorry, Mike, I just can't find it uh, quickly, but um, it is in there. Um, I'll not present these in any detail. Uh, they relate to Mike and... Um, uh, uh, Steve's work and they uh, just update you on um, activity and progress which is being made across both the hospital's directorate um, and across primary medical services and integration work. Um, they actually are recording progress and things that have happened over the summer uh, and bringing us up to date. I'm quite happy to pause on those um, rather than try and present each individual point, and Mike and Steve might want to answer any questions that colleagues have. Jennifer. Thanks. Just the basis on which Dudley are um, requesting a formal review of their rating. I mean, they, they are allowed to, and they're entitled to, and I, I, I ask for a review, sort of without... A, a giving us a, a specific reason for that. They, they've been unhappy. We have tried to find a way through this, um, which in, informally, but that was not satisfactory. So actually, it's quite useful to have a pilot of our appeal or review process. Um, so this is uh, the one that's, that, that it's being done with, and there is a completely separate team reviewing the report um, from the one that did the original National Quality Assurance Group in order that we can um, say that this is independent and we will then hear the report back from them on any changes that they feel might be appropriate for us to make. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember the specific yeah. uh, core services and the specific ratings off the top of my head. I'm afraid, um, but um, but but there, there were specifics that they were they were querying. I just can't remember exactly what they are. Any other questions for um, Camilla? Yeah. Um, just on recruitment, can you just tell us a bit more about exactly the, where the gap is and why? Because it is a bit it does look a bit large that gap. Uh, the, the gap is large. Um, we currently, at the I think beginning of August, we had about 109 um, inspectors in the hospital directorate. Uh, we should, at that point, have had 161. Um, that was the, the ramp up plan according to to the model, um, and we are looking to ramp up to just over 300 by March of next year. Um, now I think we can look at that as well, clearly. It's, so it's a gap of about 200 that we need to fill before March. Um, we can say that as, my God, that's huge in comparison with the number we've got at the moment. Actually, it's no larger than the number that some tr individual trusts are trying to recruit in terms of nurses. Um, and after all, we are recruiting from across the whole country. Um, if we got one secondment from each acute trust and mental health trust, that would completely fill our, our vacancies. We are doing a targeted approach in mental health, and uh, no doubt at all that the um, 
<coughs> expressions of interest in that have been very high. We're going through the sifting process and the interviewing process at the moment, but I think we're quite optimistic that we will fill a lot of that. And I think what it tells us is that to get the right people, we really do need targeted approaches to go to the right sector to, to get the right people. It is, it is the biggest issue we've got, Camilla, recruitment, facing the organisation at the moment, I think. I, I know, and I just wonder whether, um, because obviously the overall figures that we had, David, were, were really positive. I mean, you had a, we had a lot of applications, we had a lot of interest, didn't we? and I'm just wondering if you can just remind sort of across the piece... I mean, Mike, you know, you sound like you're saying there's, there's a lot of interest and it's a more a question of process, but then there's also an issue about are we targeting the right... So, I'm sorry, I'm just, I just want to know, is it, is it sort of... Do you think that's the same issue across the organisation? Is there something... Well, I, or I, is, it, is there a specific issue? I think, to begin with, we went for rather a generic approach to uh, oh, right. <laughs> recruitment. I think we're now doing it in a much more uh, targeted way, and I think the early results from... And well, the early results from two, two things, the first of all, the targeted mental health uh, approach, and secondly, this idea of trying to attract people on secondment from the NHS to the hospital sector. Still early days, but I, I am very hopeful that those, that will actually plug a lot of this gap. There's also a need for geographical targeting as well, Camilla. So um, I think we're now at a stage where generic adverts for inspectors need to be much more specific. So if we need a PMS inspector for Leicester, we need to go for a PMS inspector for Leicester, right. not a generic, um, we need to recruit inspectors. So I think it's probably a natural evolution for this, but we're much more targeted. There's some places where we've had more risk Response and we have vacancies, and other places where we've got more vacancies and we've had people. So I think being much more targeted, and that's what we've been doing in relation to mental health and uh, people from hospitals, and like I say, offering a different, a much more flexible way to recruit people. So um, one of the issues that is being pursued at the minute is could we offer term time contracts to people? A lot of Mike's inspections are effectively term time. There's probably a pool of people who have some caring responsibilities for whom a term time approach would actually work, it would be flexible, it would meet our needs and would actually provide us with um, people of experience and background that we're after. Whereas a generic, uh, a generic um, we need inspectors, please come and work for us, a kind of uh, First World War recruiting approach to it doesn't get to where we now think we need to be. Um, and that's one of the learning points, I think, from going for a generic campaign, where we got a huge response. We got over 8,000 yeah. expressions of interest. Yeah. The conversion rate to those expressions of interest has been very low. Oh, OK, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay. Conversion rate has gone from thousands into hundreds. That's a huge fallout. It doesn't mean we were wrong to do that, but actually we now need to know we need to be much more targeted. Can I ask one more thing on, on that? Because I, I went on one of Mike's um, our most recent hospital inspection, and, and I, I was generally very impressed. And I was particularly impressed by uh, the clinicians and some of the people we had on secondment, um, who were kind of so vital to this, to really getting onto the skin of things. And I just wondered again about the relationship to the Royal Colleges in that respect, and whether you feel that there's a sufficient pipeline of people coming through because obviously there are some brilliant people we've got at the moment but we can't we're not going to be able to rely on them forever are we well we spend quite a lot of time working with the royal colleges with professional societies i talked at the british orthopedic association's annual conference on friday for example doing those sorts of meetings on a regular basis mm. and i and I feel very disappointed if I come away from one of those meetings um, without getting some people signing up, um, either as inspection chairs or as, um, say, consultants to come on, on the, the session. So um, I think, yes, it's a constant uh, rep a repetition that we, ne that we need to, to keep the, that group of people coming through, but, but so far we've been OK. Um, the remainder of this report is really updates, although I've got two additional items to add, David. So, um, eight is just announcing that the dementia-themed inspection report will be published in October. Um, 
colleagues have that report in terms of its content, so you'll see some of the important messages that we intend to publish there. The transfer of safety functions. This really follows um, Simon Stevens when he arrived at NHS England uh, making a request to us that the safety functions which are currently vested with NHS England come to us. Um, what this paragraph is attempting to say is that that work is ongoing. Um, I'm not uh, being deliberately opaque in the way that uh, this is set out, but um, there is now um, a working um, group process been introduced in this by the Department of Health and um, will participate in that. I, I think by necessity that means that this decision uh, won't be arrived at quickly. Um, there will be due diligence which will be applied to this decision. Um, uh, so what we'll continue to do, David, is update uh, the board through this report uh, and then you can track progress. And again, I'd be very happy to answer any questions uh, either now or uh, outside of this meeting. I think the issues which are also causing delay are Simon's uh, request that uh, NHS England is not responsible for medical revalidation. I think there is, a, uh, there is a clear destination for the safety functions, CQC. I think there's a less clear destination for medical revalidation. Um, so these things are being taken as a, as a group, uh, which I think is in part uh, responsible for uh, some of the delay. That said, there are some ideological issues that people hold very firmly about whether the regulator should be the organisation to which reports are made. Um, and uh, as I say, that the ideological bit here is if they're reported to the regulator, that will discourage, not encourage people to report. Um, uh, it's an interesting proposition, as I say, it's ideological. Um, we still maintain that it's appropriate that this transfers to us. So, um, uh, TEN is just announcing that uh, there's work that the National Audit Office are doing in whistleblowing. They want us to be uh, part of that in, in terms of the role that we play in relation to whistleblowing. Uh, uh, our role as a prescribed body uh, will um, contribute to that and they'll report at the end of the year. Um, item 11 um, is uh, amendments to the scheme of delegation. These are all consequential on the 2010 Act now uh, having received royal assent being enacted. Um, and I ask uh, the board to agree to these changes. Um, I hope they're self explanatory if uh, briefly stated. And um, just to correct my report, it's to ask you to uh, agree item 11 rather than item. 10. Um, the two additional items, David, if I may. Um, we just say, is everyone happy, with, everyone happy with that scheme's delegation changes? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, the additional item to report is that on Thursday of this week, we'll publish the results of the mental health uh, survey. This is uh, a regular survey that's carried out. And uh, these are treated like reports from the National Statistics Office, so they're close, closely guarded uh, across uh, two or three people that have been engaged in uh, their generation, production and finalisation. And um, uh, it will be published on uh, Thursday. The last item I wanted to raise is in relation to um, an important case that um, uh, we previously discussed at the board, um, this is the case of the Dixon family. Um, this is a, a family that I know uh, Kay has raised uh, previously and uh, James Titcombe, our National Safety Advisor, has been heavily involved in uh, discussions uh, both with the family and, uh, and with others. It's a case where um, I think it's fair to say, David, that we've got huge sympathy with the family. This is a family who lost their daughter uh, over 10 years ago now. Um, they've raised questions about the care and treatment their daughter received and um, how that care and treatment um, has contributed, uh, perhaps contributed to um, the death of their daughter. Um, as I say, it's a case that we've had huge sympathy with. Um, James and the complaints manager met uh, the family uh, earlier this year. 
and agreed that we would uh, work with them to carry out an investigation into the background to their case. We'd hoped we could carry out that investigation jointly with NHS England. Uh, it proved uh, uh, not possible to deliver that joint investigation with NHS England. Uh, that then left CQC uh, to um, then decide uh, whether we were able to continue to offer the family uh, any way of understanding um, what happened to their daughter and whether there were any lessons that could be learnt uh, from any investigation that we were able to carry out. What that then raised is an issue of um, whether we've got the power uh, to carry out an investigation. And if we do have that power, uh, what is the nature of any investigation that we can carry out? Well, Section 48 of the 2008 Act allows us to carry out uh, reviews and investigations, that's the language that is used, um, into the way, uh, and there are four or five clauses to this uh, particular paragraph, and um, one of the clauses, which is uh, generally and broadly, not specifically related to individual cases, how care services were delivered. Um, we took the view that uh, providing we were looking at uh, how um, services had been provided and what the impact of those services had been, that we could uh, use Section 48 to carry out an investigation into um, the care and treatment um, that this family received. That continues to be our offer in relation to it. I think the family um, are probably um, concerned with that. They want more than that. They want more than we're able to offer. Uh, I think they would like a much fuller investigation which would um, uh, hold people to account if there have been failures. Uh, we're not able to carry out that kind of investigation. We continue to make the offer of a Section 48 investigation inquiry. I think what this case generates is a gap in the system for those families who have a historic concern where they feel that's not been adequately addressed. You could say there are others in the system. Is this something that the Ombudsman could do? Um, could NHS England do something? Could they refer this back to the coroner's court? Uh, are there other ways that the individual services could carry out investigations? I think the issue that the family are raising is that the failure wasn't about one service or one institution. It was about a combination of services and institutions. There's probably three services that are of concern here. So actually looking more broadly across um, people's experience of services rather than the specific uh, service. Um, in fairness to Frimley Park, they have carried out an investigation and raised some issues, and one could say that they've uh, acted entirely appropriately by attempting to understand uh, what happened historically in relation to this case. But nevertheless, I think um, what this case clearly identifies is a gap in the system. I think Robert Francis... Um, family have corresponded with Robert and Robert wrote to me prior to the last meeting. I suspect, David, if Robert had been here today, he may well have raised, this, uh, raised the case of the Dixons. Robert has also identified there's a gap in the system. He's been asked by the Secretary of State to look at historic whistleblowing cases in very much that same vein as there's a gap in the system. And I suspect there's a similar piece of work required in relation to a gap in the system for uh, historic complaints like... Um, like the one that the Dixon family are raising. So my purpose in raising it, this has been uh, a conversation which has been taking place. Uh, certainly Eileen, uh, Rebecca, uh, James uh, and I have been involved in conversation in relation to how can we uh, uh, um, demonstrate our sympathy to the family by what we can do. Um, uh, whilst, and I hope this isn't a bureaucratic comment, remaining within the powers that we've got, uh, for a whole variety of reasons remaining in the powers that we've got um, and actually working with the family. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, uh, I think it does identify a gap. So the reason in uh, raising this issue today is just to, uh, again, to use one of the phrases that Paul used earlier, to put this 
on the record in the public domain of uh, what approach we've been taking, what we've been trying to do and why, but what this case actually flags in terms of the gap that there is in the system. Thank you, David. Yeah, I mean, thanks. Uh, I mean, that was my understanding. I mean, there are kind of two issues. One is um, how the system, not necessarily us, but, but the system addresses these gaps. And I'm, I'm not quite sure how, you know, where we are with that. Because, um, you know, there's a real issue about how in investigations, independent investigations are or are not carried out, the quality of them, who commissions them. Um, and, you know, thinking ahead, this is something that we kind of need to, need to sort out, you know. I mean, it's, I'm not sure it's the role of CQC to investigate these individual failures of care. Um, but it could be a role, for example, in overseeing how a provider investigates this kind of, um, you know, catastrophic failure, um, you know, standards or something, and we kind of hold them to account for doing it in a way that's open, transparent, robust, you know. So, um, no, I think, you know, there's been a lot said on this, but, but I'm still not very clear about, you know, we all agree there's a gap, but I'm not clear, you know, what the trajectory is, you know, what are, are we actually going to get to a point where we've kind of resolved this issue? And I, I, as I say, I don't think it's for CQC to investigate all these cases. I, personally, that's my personal view. Then the other issue is this: is, is this the, is the family really? And, and there are other families as well, you know. And it's it's difficult to think, and it's the same for whistleblowers as well, of a mechanism that could actually get some closure, answers, um, justice for, 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 for these people. I mean, there are quite a lot of them. Um, and I just think, you know, is it actually possible? And I'm not so sure it is. Because what we offer is we will listen and we will learn. And I think, you know, we are actually doing that quite well. But what you still have is all these cases of, of people feeling it's unresolved and unjust. And, you know, and it's also, it seems to me, it's, it's quite unfair in a way to raise expectation if there's no ex if there really is a quite limited prospect of of the of them getting answers you know and that that worries me because you know it, the people who are kind of you know it's quite a vulnerable situation to be in to be honest um to have your kind of hopes raised and dashed and 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 when you are desperate you, you kind of cling to particular things and and you know so it's so it's kind of like the, the big issue, but also there's the issue about all these specific cases that, that are, are around and will be around, you know. And we can work to prevent this, but, you know, I don't know if there is, if it is possible to get actual closure that quite often these people want, need. Um, so, so um, I, I uh, well, I just wanted to say that this, this is, this is an issue, not this case, but this is uh, that this kind of broader issue is something that is um, uh, coming up from a, a small number of local health watch who have um, uh, been made aware by families or, 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 or uh, um, uh, and others of uh, particular local issues where um, there has I mean, of a variety of sorts, but where there has been um, uh, for the family uh, um, inadequate. Uh, exploration of uh, the issues and the if you look at it seems seem, seems to me and we've begun to have a bit of, little bit of a conversation about this at House Watch England if you look at uh, the issues very often it's because exactly actually as you described David that um, that that the powers that all of the parties in the system have are in, in ad, that each of the system bits of the system have are inadequate to the task um, and there isn't a way, um, and we had a little bit of this conversation um, uh, in a previous board meeting, there isn't a way apart from a full public inquiry of kind of exploring the, the, the complete set of issues uh, uh, to the satisfaction um, of, of, of those who are concerned. And um, so I suppose it is to say, I, 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 for... Um, in response to, to what you said, David, I mean, I agree with, with, with you entirely, Kay, it, it is... I'm not sure this is for CQC, but I think it may be for Healthwatch England um, uh, to uh, to think um, a bit harder about how um, uh, uh, wh where these issues are across uh, the whole of the system, because I think they are across the whole of the system, um, 
and uh, to look at the issues that are emerging from Local Health Watch um, and uh, try to work with a variety of people to look at what, 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 what a, uh, a more system-wide solution to this might look like. So that's not a commitment, because I couldn't possibly um, uh, make that without um, conversation with the, the, the staff and the committee at Health Watch England, but it's to say it is emerging for us too, and I think it is a... Um, so I think we should be cautious here at the CQC board and at the CQC about taking it on because I think it's bigger than, than, than us and outside our, our purview. But I do think um, it's important that someone addresses it and it may be that there's something we could usefully do at Health Watch England there. Um, just two brief points. Um, my own brief conversation with the family made it very clear that they were very disappointed that NHS England appeared to have offered something it then withdrew. Um, and I think Kay's absolutely right about raising expectations, but I, I, I'm interested to know how that happened, because I think that was really very unfortunate indeed. And I think NHS England also misled the CQC into what it was proposing. And it may be that that's, it's not in its remit, but I don't quite understand how it got itself into that position. Um, and the second point is just whether we can offer something through the well-led domain. I mean, if you're, if you're going to be specific, you know, if we're in inspecting a particular service, are we going to use cases like that to have the conversation with the chief executive, even if they weren't the person in post? Are we having those conversations? Are we actually going into the room and saying, well, on our shopping list happens to be, you know, these three cases that your organisation failed to properly investigate? And I just wonder, is that going to be... It's, a, it's actually probably a small thing in the grand scheme of our inspections, but this is fundamentally about being accountable and it is about being well led and it is this residual fear that there are a lot of people employed in services who haven't been held to account for these things. So there's just a sort of question about whether that's a way we can get some traction on it. Well, if we do this in a... I'll, uh, so if I kind of take all three, Deb, yeah, is definitely. that what you want? Yeah. Um, so in, in relation to at least um, one of the cases that, um, that I, I'm very aware of that's come to us, um, actually a very similar thing where NHSC um, undertook to um, uh, do an investigation and then change the terms of that investigation, um, which made it less uh, satisfactory. So, um, I mean, not to make them wholly responsible for all of this, but I mean, it's just a point to the fact that, 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 this, that we are not collectively managing this very, very well. So, um, two or three things. Um, I think to Anna and Kay, um, I think what Robert has been asked to do in relation to historic whistleblowers um, is really helpful because it, it's a kind of let's pause and think this through and think it through in the round rather than uh, the difficulty of this is people reach for an immediate solution and say what we need to do is this. And it needs to be thought through in the round. I th uh, Anna, your analysis that um, different people can actually pay different contributions to this, um, uh, I think is absolutely spot on. So the Parliamentary and Health Ombudsman is the organisation that deals with second stage complaints. Um, so there are different bits of the system. The coroner's court can reopen inquiries. The standard and the threshold for it is quite high, but if there's new and different information, then that can be triggered. So there are all different ways, but none of themselves are perfect in, I think, what you've been referring to, which is often what a lot of families want. Um, and I think a lot of the families want somebody to be accountable for what happened. So I think they've gone beyond understanding what happened. They've gone beyond an apology being an acceptable resolution to it. They actually want somebody to be held to account. And there probably is a relationship between the longer this has gone on, the more that people are into wanting an accountability outcome from this rather than an understanding. But that needs thinking through and uh, conversations need to be had. I, I do think the duty of candour, although it won't be retrospective, will actually change this dynamic very, very powerfully. Um, um, so I think careful thought and thinking it through and Health Watch playing a role in that, and I, I'm, I'm sure he's right. Um, for all the cases we get to know about, I'm sure there are lots that we don't get to know about as well, because people are with solicitors, are battling it through by themselves and raising it in all kinds of different ways. Um, 
Um, Camilla, to your point about uh, what happened, um, um, colleagues in CQC had been working with colleagues in NHS England. Um, we thought an understanding had been arrived at and that had gone as far as actually beginning to shape contracts and written expectations. There was a decision taken at a senior level in NHS England that um, NHS England would not get involved in carrying out investigations. That decision was made and um, uh, has been held to. Um, that meant that what was being planned, uh, and this is a combination of different responsibilities, us working with somebody might have been a better offer than us working by themselves. Uh, us working by ourselves meant that uh, and one of the phrases I've used is we were the last person standing in relation to the offer. Um, I don't want us to withdraw that offer, but um, I'm also aware that the family probably won't be satisfied with the offer that we're making. Um, and that's the gap. So that's, that's what happened. Um, um, and I think the way this has been reported subsequently, I think that story is out because the family have told the story. I think um, uh, they know because um, my colleagues, uh, Eileen and colleagues that were dealing with the family, have been quite open with them about where we were at. And this decision was taken on the Friday before the family were coming in for a meeting on the Monday. So by that time, it had been explained to them why they were coming in for a meeting and what the purpose of the meeting was. So the, the expectations having been raised, the, um, the cruelty of this, um, there isn't another way, I'm with Kay on this, was that expectations were raised to be, um, to be taken away. So um, uh, this is really what's behind the phrase, uh, we, had, we do have sympathy for this family. In relation to the well-led bit, Mike, Mike will say about what we're doing now, the trickiness about a case which goes back over 10 years is it doesn't raise immediate issues of safety. And indeed, we've been into Frimley Park, which is a hospital. We've not yet announced that, so it would be premature to do uh, the outcome of that. But um, we think Frimley is doing a good job. That doesn't mean to say that when this happened in this family's case, they were doing a good job then. Um, so it is this issue, this is why the historic cases is a gap. If this was a recent case where the current management or board of the hospital were the same uh, as when the incident occurred now, then I think legitimately we would say there is no doubt that we've got a role to play in this and this case raises an issue about leadership, the culture of safety and quality. But because it's a historic case over 10 years, um, it does raise uh, separate, separate issues. So there are other families that have raised their concerns about where they've been dealt with, which are more contemporary, um, where we are able to say we will look at this specifically in the next inspection. Um, I think we've, uh, Mike and myself have talked about meeting families in Bristol who have raised their concerns around paediatric cardiac surgery. We can actually take that. That is live information, which does raise questions that we think we need to explore when we carry out the inspection. It's this, it's this historic cases, and there is a case about how old do they have to be. I, I, I personally think, uh, this is a danger of making personal statements, but this is why it needs thinking through. About five years ago, I think there would have been a different response to this is time expired. And I think Hillsborough, Rochdale, uh, uh, stuff in South Yorkshire means I don't think you can, I, I don't think there's any currency in saying something's time expired. I think that argument has now gone in public services. I think we've got to say if this happened, people are aggrieved by it, there needs to be some form, some mechanism that people can get some way of uh, uh, achieving satisfaction in relation to that. So those of us that say, I'm sorry, we've got it's three years, it's time expired, I don't think that works now. I think the whole nature of this debate has changed, which is why I think um, this issue about thinking it through carefully needs to be taken forward. So sorry, this is just a quick point, and it's about where there are concurrent issues um, raised. Um, and I, I'm still slightly young, this is a slightly separate question, but where we say, okay, we, we will scoop up this intelligence and when we next inspect, we will 
then look for this or the issue, or where we say actually it could be that our inspection simply is not the right lens to look at this particular issue that's raised. Therefore, we will have a special investigation of what sort. I just, I, I kind of, I don't feel totally, because we kind of do have had discussions about special investigations, and I just wonder where we are on the criteria for those and precisely what, uh, have, we, have we bottomed out our thinking in that area? This is on con contemporary issues, but actually you could also say, in the light of this conversation, that the um, special investigation could respond to a historic problem where there's more than one incident. There's a pattern of... of, of um, just to, to respond to that, at the moment we, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis um, and there are at least a couple of focused inspections that I can think of that have been triggered, particularly in those cases, by whistleblowing, where we would then look at a specific aspect of care delivered in the trust. But then we've used what comes out of that focused inspection to inform our comprehensive inspection, which in both cases took place within about six months of the, of the focused in, in, inspection. So um, it's not always a question of saying that will wait for a comprehensive inspection. Um, certainly, um, we will take each case on its own merits and see whether we need to go in straight away. And it can be quite a useful prelude to the comprehensive inspection. Um. It's only the, I mean, this is difficult because the problems have so many facets, but I'm just wondering whether we have clarity in order for consistency in our judgment as to what is a special investigation and what can wait until, um, but that's, that's all, it's a threshold, is to, 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 in surfacing it, it might be useful to protect us in a sense and to protect families. I think it's a really important question, and I think, in, in, in truth, I think Mike's point is each individual case on its merits. It's certainly um, these are the kind of issues uh, that generate a conversation across us, where if there's differences of opinion, we'll test this out. So um, these are exactly the cases that Mike would come to me and perhaps Paul and say, "Tell me what you think." So we'll try these out. Um, so I think we have done the work that we've referred to on where do we carry out investigations, what are the thresholds by it. We've gone through the thematic studies, et cetera. Um, but I think in truth, Jennifer, we're still working that out. Each individual case on its merits is where we are. Uh, as Mike said, we will bring forward action. Uh, we'll get complaints that mean that we'll go in straight away and uh, look at what's um, been uh, referred to us and there'll be others will say well actually we do know about this um, this isn't in inverted commas new and we will build it into the next uh, inspection plan some of that will depend on how far ahead is the next <coughs> inspection and we've revised uh, our plans uh, we'll do exactly that in relation to primary medical services and adult social care as well uh, um, in, in truth. But I think this is something we continue to work at without stealing into the next debate, David. But it seems to me that um, my reference to the duty of candour is I think we may well get more individual cases referred to us where people feel that they've not been told, um, in inverted commas, the truth um, uh, in relation to an incident that has happened to them. So I think this is an issue that we're going to need to spend more time with and more time bottoming. But um, um, uh, I wouldn't want to say that we've actually resolved this and, uh, to use your phrase, bottomed it. I think it is something that we continue to work on because it is inherently difficult. Uh, when does an individual case flag something about the safety of a, the way an organisation is? Um, uh, should we be looking for the patterns? Well, I think we are clear on that. Yes, we do need to look for the patterns. But uh, on these individual cases, what what, um, what weight do we give that? So at the minute, we are considering each, each one, and um, they do get weighed. I suggest that um, on the historic cases, like this tragic case of the Dixons, that we have a, a, a conversation with Robert Francis outside this meeting and kick it and just think it through a little bit more and maybe bring it back to the next meeting when we've had a chance to do that. That'd be all right. Because um, I do think there are, there are so many analogies with the work he's doing on, on the old whistleblowing cases as well. There, there may be a, a way of tying this into, into, that in, in, into that investigation that he's doing on that. Can we do that? Um, so the answer to Michael's question, 53% uh, 
um, said their personal morale was good. I'm, I'm losing people. <laughs> um, so this is the item about the provider handbooks and links to Lewis's earlier comment. Um, by way of context, we've been through a significant process of consultation since we released the draft provider handbooks back in April. Um, board will remember that we do handbooks for a number of the different sectors in line with our sector-specific regulations. So, for example, domiciliary care is separate to residential care in Andrea's sectors and separate again to hospice care um, in Mike's sectors. We have separate handbooks for mental health for um, uh, community health services and for acute trusts. Um, with the response, with the consultation closed um, a month or two ago, uh, while we get strong support for most of the elements, including the importance of an expert, well trained inspection workforce, where people raised uh, issues with us, was particular how would we ensure consistency? Um, and that's very much in line, of course, with Kieran Walsh's report, and also about how we are. Uh, setting the bar on outstanding, um, which is one of the points that we'll want to come to in the body of the paper. In terms of when we would plan to publish subject to the board's views today, uh, we would pub uh, plan publication in three tranches. So on the 25th, so a week on Thursday, week tomorrow, uh, we, would uh, we would publish the handbooks for mic sectors and also the uh, appendices which set out the detailed key lines of inquiries and characteristics of good. Uh, and other uh, ratings levels for adult social care. That's to give people the maximum, uh, providers, uh, the maximum um, time to understand uh, what we will be assessing from October onwards. Uh, we would follow that up on the um, uh, Thursday, I believe it's the 9th or 10th of October, with the primary medical services, um, and at the end of October uh, for the hospices document. Um, just because we've been asked by the hospice sector to uh, look particularly at one or two issues, and we want to make sure we give that due attention. There are five sets of recommendations in the paper um, and a series of additional in pieces of information to note. My suggestion is we step through each of those five recommendations. So those start on page two. Um, the first issue is about locking down the provider handbooks. And by this we mean that in order to give providers um, and members of the public and, of course, our inspectors um, uh, maximum uh, consistency and stability of our model, we propose that once these handbooks are released um, uh, from uh, next Thursday onwards, uh, they are then locked at the level of the core assessment framework for a period of two years. That allows us to get round and rate everybody in all the sectors that we intend to rate for the uh, sectors that are covered by the handbooks. We think that's an important principle so that we're not forever changing how uh, people are assessed and there's a, there's a consistent baseline. That doesn't mean that every aspect of um, the detail of uh, what uh, precise questions or the way in which information might be elicited is locked for two years and that would be a big mistake because we will learn as we go. But the key point is the framework against which we're judging um, is locked. That's the key lines of inquiries and the description of what the, um, the individual ratings uh, levels are. And that's uh, basically, therefore, the recommendation says. Shall I pause on that one and then we. Uh, just, just agree them as we go along if we can. Is everyone happy with that? With that? Anna? I, I just want to test it, if that's okay. So, um, uh, to make sure I, I understand it and, and feel comfortable with it. So, so one of the things. Um, uh, that we're doing alongside the inspections is the thematic work. And one of the um, uh, important elements of the thematic work is that it tells us something about the boundaries between different sectors. And we know that at the moment our, our key lines of inquiry don't take um, probably proper account of uh, 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 that integrated pathway as opposed to the sectoral issues because and that's why we're doing the thematic studies because we want to understand more about the passing across uh, between different different sectors. So we've, we, we, you mentioned in your report the uh, thematic report on uh, uh, on uh, dementia, um, and that that indicates that there are indeed some issues about exactly those boundary questions. So I would want us to be um, able 
um, as we look at that, that report and others of that sort to build into our inspections some, uh, some focus around those boundaries as we learn, as we understand what, what, what the issues are. Uh, is the logic of agreeing this, that we can only do that in however many, you know, in a year's time or whatever, however long it is, or, or is that because we're, we've locked down the handbook, or is that the kind of thing that would still be, be possible to change? So uh, I might do this by way of an example and use dementia if it's helpful. Um, the handbooks are deliberately provider specific, so by definition, they're not going to. Um, start from the, the perspective of a, a patient's care right throughout their journey. So there's a limitation and it's acknowledged and they don't try to solve that entirely. They do have a number of prompts and in some cases lines of inquiry that allow us to explore, for example, the quality of discharge, just as, as one example. So I think in, in terms of what we'd be able to learn from dementia and transfer in after the handbooks were locked down, um, we would absolutely be able to say, well, it, it turns out this is a particular um, population group that has problems um, uh, as they navigate through the um, pathways of care or, or those navigated for them. Um, and we might therefore say, I'm not saying we would, but we might therefore say we need as part of our inspections in care homes or in primary medical services or in, 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 in hospitals to focus particularly on that population group and look at what their journey is. So we might take them as a case example. And we've talked about that in the past for people with uh, dementia, people with diabetes, people with a learning disability or a mental health condition. All of that would be totally reasonable to look at and, um, and change as we go through the, the years ahead or the, the months ahead. But what we wouldn't do is fundamentally change how we would judge good for a provider against the, key, against the individual ratings, core services and the key lines of inquiry. So we could change how we look at it on which particular lenses, but the assessment framework itself stays the same. So just to continue, because I think it's import, important to know how much flexibility we've got or not. So if, if we established in, I, I, again, I'm using that example because, it, because it's, it's kind of current and present in our minds, um, uh, that um, actually the key lines, of, the, the way we phrase the key line of inquiry in relation to discharge was not fit for purpose because having done the dementia review we had established that actually we needed to be asking the question in a different way or a different set of questions we wouldn't be able to change it until we were able to unlock the uh, um, uh, the process is that right that is right and if there was an overwhelming reason i think there's a reasonableness test if we found for whatever reason perhaps the the way in which care was being delivered fundamentally changed of course we would update it but the principle is that that the key lines of inquiry wouldn't change. The prompts, however, could change, and we could, um, for example, on dementia, one or four people in a hospital bed um, uh, like to have dementia, uh, we may feel that we need to use the evidence, particularly from that population group, to inform the way we close that key line of inquiry. But to be categoric, the key line of inquiry wouldn't change. So can I just want one, 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 one more? So a so, um, so couple of questions then. How long are we locking it down for? What's the cycle? And, uh, um, uh, and I suspect it's probably different in the different sectors, but what's, how, how long are we locking it down for? And what would a reasonable test look like? Because my, I suppose my, my, my concern in respect of this specific is that we have quite rightly and understandably and you know, knowingly decided to build our inspection regimes around sectors but we also have always said that we know that by doing that, what we are not properly taking address or, uh, account of are, are the, the real patient experience of health and social care and the journeys that they take across it, which is what the thematic work is there to help us with. Um, and so my mm -hmm. assumption has always been that we will develop our inspection regimes on the, on the back of the thematic work. And I, I wouldn't want to wait too long before we start building that in, because we just build in, uh, overemphasise um, in a long, long-term way the uh, uh, the sectoral agenda. I know Andrew wants to come in on this as well. Uh, two years is the proposal, um, but I think the specific of that is until we've uh, got round to everybody wants on rating on a sector. So, um, in some cases, our, our current commitments are shorter than the two-year timescale, but two years is our sort of, you know the, our mental model. Um, but the, the principle is so that we've rated everybody in that sector. Um, what would the reasonableness test be? Well, I think we would need to do it on a case by case, but I think we would set the bar very high. 
otherwise everything will be well we could we could tweak that but what i would say is the key lines of inquiry are high level to take the safety key lines of inquiry the the first one is you know what is the record on past harm that's a very broad set question under which there are a whole series of prompts and we may well want to change the prompts if we find to take an example another thematic if we were to find that it turns out the urinary tract infections are skyrocketing in an area we would absolutely want to uh, encourage uh, our inspectors to ask more questions about the uh, UTI management um, and hydration. But that wouldn't be about changing the key line of inquiry. I, I'm, don't, I want to hand over to Andrea if there's a... So it was just to, to reinforce um, some of the things that, that Paul has said, but um, to give hopefully additional um, uh, assurance um, for Anna and the board. Um, I mean, the critical reason why we, we need to do this is that issue that's constantly raised with us about consistency in terms of the judgments that we're making and ensuring that um, when we're publishing um, uh, uh, the um, uh, assessments that we're making that people can see that that's comparable from you know Northumberland to Netherwallop. So there's a there's a really good um, uh, 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 reason for it behind it, and also a really important thing in terms of ensuring um, that across all of our three inspection directorates, we're training our staff um, so that they understand and know what it is that they should be looking at and how, and we're not constantly changing the goalposts for them either, um, because that that you know, in the period of time that we've had in adult social care of doing two waves of inspection and then um, preparing for full rollout, we have been changing things and that has been very, very stressful um, for people uh, to cope with. Um, but Paul's right, the key lines of inquiry are at a, I, I think, a sufficiently um, high level for us to be able to um, uh, inform them with um, the better understanding of what good looks like in certain services. Um, and that's certainly, you know, taking dementia as an example, that's certainly one of the things that we'd be wanting to do in, in, in adult social care is ensure um, that um, we, we, we um, uh, ask people to, to look at the environment and ensure that it's e effective and responsive to people's needs. Well, if something comes out that says this is the blindingly obvious thing that you should be doing about the environment, then we'd be making sure that, that people knew that. And the last but not leastly point is um, the, the, the bit that kind of prompted you to get into this, Anna, was the, um, the link across. So, you know, we are regulating locations and services. We're not regulating um, the pathway of care. But in the questions that we are asking about whether a service is well led, one of the absolutely critical aspects of that is how well are the services working with others to support um, uh, uh, the needs of the people um, who are using that service. And again, I think that helps us to get into some of the things that the uh, dementia-themed um, work was exposing, which, for example, is the transfer of information from care home to hospital, from hospital to care home. Um, so I think that there's, there's aspects of the way that we've constructed it in the detail, which I think actually helps us to get into the specific issue that you were raising. Thanks. Um, well, broadly, I'm in favour of the, uh, having a period of stability. I think it's only fair to the people we rate to say that for a period of time we're not going to make major changes. But there is a, um, a broader issue here, I think, than the thematic review. I, I agree with your, the thrust of your question, Anna, but it is also about the other uh, areas of information that we take in, in making a judgment. Uh, at the moment, we have a system where we have, there are several components of how we're judging, but in the end, we're, we have an inspection-based uh, rating. And so if you um, find something which, uh, I think if I understood your last answer, that has come out of a thematic review, then what that will do is influence how you then approach the inspection, what, how you ask, ask the questions, and how far you go in exploring what's, what's come through the thematic um, approach. Uh, but it might be more than that. It might be that we get um, a point where the, our ability to collect better patient information, our ability to use statistical data, reaches the point where it isn't enough to, to allow the inspection process to be a filter through which that information is then reassessed. That if you've got enough data from the statistics to say that this rating should be, um, requires improvement, that should be the, the rating. And the inspection can't in the end, no, no the inspection can't, it, it, when we get to that point, 
that, that we can't then have the inspection trumping all other sources of information. The inspection is a, is a potentially flawed way of judging because it's time limited, it's a snapshot, and it's up to us. This is, I'm afraid, why my strategic question does need an answer. The, um, we have to be looking to, uh, to enhance the impact of the statistical data, the patient data, the complaint data, um, and the way that trusts respond to what they're told. Uh, and that will reset the balance of what the inspections are for. They're not really just to filter anything else we get to see if it's true. They are there to offer a different, a, 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 in the end, a component of how we assess the trusts. And so I, I, I agree with the two years, but it is more than just a period of stability. It's our strategic deadline, surely. It's our deadline for getting the other areas of information up to the level that they need to be at in order for us to rely less on inspection and more on objective fact. Yeah, so. Be because of comp we agree with this point, Lewis, we set out very clearly in the handbooks, both in the consultation version and the final versions, subject to what we discussed today, um, that there are that inspection does not equal judgment. There are four components. We have a little jigsaw picture of, um, of which inspection is just one for people's edification. The, uh, the four are the ongoing relationship with the provider and all the information we get from them in the run-up, but also throughout the year. Uh, secondly, all the intelligent monitoring, whatever source that comes from, that's not just the quantitative data, but to the earlier discussion, we need to build up that qualitative side. The third is in the up to 20 week period pre-inspection, all the work that's made, the data that's made available to us that we wouldn't otherwise get. Of course, that has a heavy emphasis on listening to people's concerns and staff concerns in that pre-inspection period. And then there's the inspection itself. Now, Let's not pretend, though, that inspection is a very significant element of it and can suddenly be seen as the dominant element. I think Kieran's report shows uh, in, uh, the data in the way our inspectors see what's the most um, uh, relative levels of importance, and they clearly see the act of the inspection as the most important currently. So I think your, your point that, that we should challenge whether that is the right place to, to stay is well taken, and we are doing that through the intelligence-driven work. But equally, we have no plans uh, to set out something that says, at the moment, it's inspection that is, it equals regulation. It must stay as those four components. So um, Mike often jokes to me that if there, if there was no point in inspection, there'd be no point in him. And to flip it the other way around, if, there was, if it was purely inspection, you know, you probably don't need me around the table either. I'm not quite sure. I'm, I'm, um, can, can, can I just come in on this? But because actually we're already doing it, Lewis. If you look, come to the acute inspections, you will find that it is a balance. It, it is a blend of the data and what we see on inspection. And in some domains, it is much more strongly data than it is inspection. You cannot, in an acute hospital, judge effectiveness. In other words, are, is that hospital making people better on what you see on the day? You, you, you just don't see, see enough. Uh, so you have to judge that uh, on effectiveness, which comes from national clinical audits. It comes from mortality data, a whole range of different sources. But we are absolutely reliable, reliant on data for that. Equally. On on the caring domain, um, it is, it, we would have to have an overpowering the good reason to rate something as good if the in CQC inpatient survey said that they were well below average. And we do look at that. So we are blending those. Um, and in the um, responsiveness domain, we always look at the various performance data, like four-hour targets or 18 weeks, as well as other factors, including complaints. Um, so in all of those, and in the well-led domain, we take the staff survey alongside what we hear from the, um, from the leaders and from the staff of the, of the hospital. So it is already a blend. Okay, but I, that's fine. I don't think that's enough, the, because the we the good the good information. Of course, it would be appalling if we were saying we weren't taking account of good information. But a lot of the information isn't any good. That's the problem. Um, and as that gets better, as that gets better, the balance of how that information is influences ratings has to change. Now that will affect what we've just said about locking things down for for two years. It's bound to affect it. Well, I can't see how it can't. Um, and so um, as an, an inspection in some ways, if we had really good data, the inspection, the, the role of inspection could be more targeted, it could be less subjective. 
uh, and uh, it could improve. So it, it, I don't think it necessarily does you out of a job, Mike, but it does change the nature of our reliance on different bits of uh, an evaluation system. Now, so my point is that I agree with the two years, I agree with the composite uh, uh, approach to ratings, but it will change. Um, and it, and if it, it, it has to change, and, and that change ought to, is partly based on having more reliable uh, data, which inspections struggle to provide, I would say. Sorry, could I, could I just say, I don't want to prolong the discussion, but um, yes, we need better data, but we will be looking at things across adult social care and primary medical services and hospitals, mental health and all the rest of it, and it will be slightly different in all of those areas. So when we have the discussion um, in the future about how we're influencing what we're doing, we have to understand that we're in different places um, in terms of the, um, the both the um, uh, quality and quantity of the data that we've got available to us. Um. I think, Paul, I think where we are is that there's a general agreement that there should, for the sake of consistency we need to have some lockdown, but there does need to be a reasonable over, override on that. I mean, if something fundamentally changed the data over the next two years, for example, the balance between looking at objective data and inspections changed, or on Anna's point in terms of the integrated care pathways, accountable care organisations and the like, you know, we need to have some flexibility around those sort of big issues if they change. I, I hear that on the reasonables we can, we can also take away. If it's helpful to sort of to set criteria, we can certainly think it through. But I, I want to be really clear that you, we have an enormous swing in the quality of data in a sector. For, um, for example, t take the past harms example on, on the first key line of inquiry and safety. Each of those key lines of inquiry is always informed by the four elements. So if we suddenly had the absolutely categoric best data we needed to adjudge safety in maternity, then that we wouldn't need to change the key line of inquiry at all. The prompts might need to change, the data sources might need to change, and all of those would say will change continuously. But the underlying key line of inquiry doesn't need to change because we're judging past, we're looking at past harm. Okay. Can I just say, it, Lewis, I would hate you to think I was being dismissive of your point, because I think it is a hugely important one. And, and so and we definitely need to keep coming back to it, actually, this balance between objective data, good data, and inspection. I mean, it is extremely important. So, I mean, keep banging away at it, I think, is the message, because it is very important. Uh, Michael. Yeah, apologies if I was out of the room when um, this was discussed, but it does link um, to Lewis's point, which um, I completely agree with. I, I am not entirely sure about the idea, and I'm, uh, say I'm not sure whether you got to this or about to get to this, of ditching the characteristics of good against each of the key lines of inquiries, because I actually thought the characteristics of good was probably the strongest part of the, um, the key lines of inquiry. And I'm just looking for, you know, as an example, at um, safety, which I think um, you know, it does connect with um, Lewis's point. And the, the question is whether, in the, you know, now that we're having a 20-week period before an inspection, whether there are areas which are currently looked at during the inspection, which could be looked at, or at least um, more information gathered before the inspection. For example, you know, one of the safety um, in acute hospitals, there's a safety um, key line of inquiry, S2, has the provider learn when things go wrong and improve safety standards as a result. And one of the characteristics of good is the provider investigates when things go wrong using robust approaches, including root cause analysis and so on. I, I think it's very important to understand whether the provider is doing that. But if we've got 20 weeks you know, uh, before an inspection, is that the kind of question? You know, and I think this is why I think it does relate to Lewis's point, that is subject to actually being able to ask for that information as opposed to, during the inspection itself, try to ascertain that. I mean, it may be that the answer to the question you know, in the uh, pre-inspection period is not very good and therefore it should be something on which the inspection uh, 
takes a close look at. But in principle, quite a lot of these characteristics are good, which I think are, um, are very impressive in, in their uh, detail. Um, I think they are actually better than the characteristics of good you know, which um, are used for answering the key question. I mean, the, <clears throat> you know, what were the five domains, <clears throat> now the five key questions. But as you go through these characteristics, good numerous parts of them, I think, are open to being able to ask the, you know, in this case, the hospital or the trust beforehand, as opposed to um, trying to answer this uh, question during the inspection itself. Can I, can I answer that? I think it's absolutely the, the direction of travel that we're taking. I think when we started out, we <coughs> started by asking trusts for a mass of documents. Um, we still need some documents from them, but uh, I think that the move is far more to have a pre-inspection questionnaire which focuses on things. So just to take one example, if we ask them about their complaints process uh, and there are a dozen questions we want to ask them, it's much more cost effective in terms of their time and our time to get that information uh, written down and sent back to us before the inspection so that when we talk to the complaints manager and or the chief executive, we're having an informed conversation, knowing what their process is, um, and, um, and we start the conversation there, whereas I've done these in, um, interviews in the past, you spend the first 40 minutes actually just trying to find out what it is that they do in the trust. So that's very much the direction of travel. How far are they down the line towards providing seven-day services? Well, if we have a questionnaire that asks about what's going on in gastroenterology and re respiratory medicine and intensive care, whatever it may be, um, we, we can get that uh, information and it will make our time on site much, much more effective uh, and could potentially even affect the size of our teams. I'm not saying it will. I mean, Lewis could respond to that. I mean, obviously, he'll respond to that by saying, you know, if there is such a questionnaire, you know, why should we wait to send that every two years or, or whatever this period is? Why shouldn't this be a questionnaire that you know, the CQC, I don't know if we've got powers to do it or powers to compel answers to it or whatever, but, you know, perhaps we should be sending this every six months or some version of it as opposed to every two years. And the, oh, I think Camilla's thinking <laughs> this, this is a huge burden on hospitals. But it, it's, um, you know, if these are really important questions, and to take Lewis's point, um, make, you know, these these difficult um, judgments more susceptible to, um, you know, rigorous analysis or statistical analysis, I think that would be helpful. Just, just to say, say on that, Paul and I have had this d d d discussion a, a lot and about the difference effectively between self-report and self-assessment. I think at this stage we're very keen for the trusts to, to report, but the assessment remains in our hands. Um, and, um, I, and, and that's certainly my experience from previous roles, that actually you can get facts and, and figures out of uh, organisations, but we, we still need to be in charge of the deciding what whether that's good. But, I, you know, I think we are still developing uh, the model pre-inspection questionnaire, but that won't be stopped by a lockdown. You know, that, 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 that can go on, we will get, get better and better at that, and there are new areas that will come up and we will add those in all the time. Um, so this was partly a, a conversation that started at the Regulatory Governance of Values Committee yesterday, this, this sense of, of what information we can ask and how we can ask it in a more structured way, and it's sparked an internal conversation with um, David and Mike and myself, just on the hospital side. Um, subject to what our policy colleagues um, in, in my area do, look at the fine detail of it, I think we would want to give, give quite a strong statement about um, this being the way we will do things. Um, uh, that may well that would I think stop short of, of self-assessment, but we would expect um, a clear and open statement from our providers in, in the hospital sector certainly um, as to what you know they saw their quality being as now that we have an assessment framework. I think it would also put to rest some of the things that are reported about how we just turn up and tell people what they already know. Let's find out, shall we? Um, it was really the latter point <coughs> which led to the discussion yesterday, which is that, 
It's probably not true when trusts say that we knew about all of this already. But at the moment, we've got no ability to counter that argument. Um, and in, it, we also, you know, Paul as a, you know, you know, former partner of PwC and myself, you know, we're used to clients saying, well, we knew this. Um, you're just telling us what we already knew. So therefore, if part of the 20 weeks was actually asking the provider, you know, what, do you, what are your key issues and what are you doing about them, it would, it might well prevent this response of, you've just told us what we already know. Because we would have asked them, you know, in advance what their issues are. So. Just so you know, we do do that in adult social care. Um, the provider information return is, is is on that basis. Tell us what, tell us how you ensure that services are safe, and tell us what your challenges are and what you're doing about them. Can we go back to to, to the question, um, which is locking it down for two years? I, I think, in the interest of consistency, the argument for locking it down is is accepted, but there are some caveats. I mean, it's clearly there's a major change then bring it back to the board pool. But in principle, I think we'll agree with the two years. Is that all right? I think, we, would press on. I think we need to press on a little bit more quickly, Paul. I blame yes, you. I'm sorry for that, then. <laughs> 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 Righto. Uh, well, on the um, prompts and the ratings characteristics, which is uh, the second part, um, Michael leads into this. Um, uh, the pro proposal is to move away from having, for every key line of inquiry, a description of what good looks like, um, but instead to, uh, to take all the information that was in the draft handbooks at that level and make sure it's reflected either in a prompt as to the way in which the question is asked or in the characteristics at the key question level. And what we're exploring is a, is a few ways to have, um, avoid uh, or to, to mitigate against losing uh, quality of, what we've, uh, of the way we look at things uh, is to, firstly, can we character in the way we describe the four ratings levels at the key question level, would it be helpful to cluster the elements of good or requires improvement under the original key lines of inquiry. So that's one way to do it, and the team is just looking through that. Uh, we, we have a series of um, proposals which are in the information section about getting better at the recording of how each key line of inquiry was closed and the evidence for that, and we will invest in systems to make sure that's, uh, that happens. That was a particular recommendation from the National Information Governance Committee, as you see in the later paper. Um, so, as this was based on quite strong feedback from uh, the consultation, including from our inspectors on how it was uh, best to, to inspect and regulate, and they were worried, uh, and I was worried that we would move to a sort of tick box culture if we just said, if you see these good things at the key line of inquiry level, then away you go. Um, we think this is the right thing to do, but we also think it's the right thing to do to put safeguards in place so we don't lose the valuable information that was there. Okay. Um, two additional key lines of inquiry um, that we would want to include. Uh, that's one on um, consent um, and bringing the consent key line of inquiry in the Mental Capacity Act key line of inquiry into, a, into a single CLOE. Uh, and the other is for the health providers, so that's the providers covered by Steve and um, Mike's areas for the avoidance of doubt, um, uh, to have a specific key line of inquiry about the Qual uh, the way in which information is used uh, to give good care. Um, and by that I mean at the moment in the draft uh, reports we have a number of prompts buried in different key lines of inquiry that look at different levels of information and information governance. But again, as the National Information Governance Committee advised us, and I think internal discussions as well, uh, we weren't putting due emphasis on if you are a doctor with a um, looking uh, or treating an individual patient, do you have the information you need to make the right diagnosis, care plan and treatment? Do you have the scans, the path tests, the case history and so forth? Um, and we wanted to elevate that to a key line of inquiry and then record the evidence as to whether or not um, uh, that, that line of inquiry was closed, whether the provider was doing the right job on that. 
So those are the two key lines and cry we would want to add. Very quick question. You know the consent one? It says consent and the Mental Capacity Act. Is it consent including the Mental Capacity Act or is it more about the Mental Capacity Act? Because obviously a lot of people are actually consenting or could consent and, you know, so it's not just about the Mental Capacity Act and it is quite a big issue, I think. Um, just yes, I'm with that. Clarify it's both and not... It, it, it is absolutely both. So under the prompts or underneath that key line of inquiry, it looks at the issue of consent, but it also looks at the issues related to the, uh, the Mental Capacity Act. Um, on the ratings principles, and you'll see there's quite a lot of detail on this before we get to the recommendations on page five. We've had a, a number of board discussions about how we set the, um, uh, those aggregation principles in particular. Uh, one of the uh, questions that was raised in the consultation was, were we being too generous on outstanding? Mm -hmm. So uh, the principle we had set was that across each of the five qu uh, core questions, a provider would have to be outstanding on two of those for its overall level of outstanding, uh, level to be outstanding. Uh, that was applying at the level of the overall provider, which is the level uh, in adult social care uh, that we go to, we just have the five core questions and the overall rating. But for primary medical services and um, in the hospital sector, we, have, we also break down that ratings grid into either core services or population groups. And so that principle was applying at, for example, maternity. Um, so we had challenge on whether that was just not setting the bar high enough. We've looked at that in quite some detail and debated that quite a lot. We think the arguments are stronger for maintaining it at two, with the main reasons for that being, firstly, so uh, when we look at the data from the different sectors, we, have, we would have very few at the level of 1% of providers coming out at outstanding, and there is more information on that in the annex and the appendix, and we don't think that's consistent with demonstrating that outstanding is credible. Um, and secondly, we would like the opportunity as time progresses to, um, uh, after the lockdown, period ends to um, to raise the bar and one way we can raise the bar is at that stage to look at going to three outstandings but we do think that at this stage two outstandings is the um, is the appropriate uh, principle and I'll pause on that one because it's important to people my suggestion David we, we might just pause on that one in particular but there's a whole series of recommendations one to seven on page 13 which relate to the aggregation principles um, any any comment for Paul on that? Um, I mean, Jennifer, do you have any thing you want to say? No, I mean, I thought that looked sensible. That even three percent is quite a low figure, isn't it, for outstanding? But it's better than one percent, quite right, or less yeah. than one percent. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm saying I think it looks reasonable, but three uh, percent is still quite low. That's not me. Remember, Andrew, on those. Um, in that wave, were they risk? They were just an average group of adult social care providers. They weren't risk assessed, were they? No, it was an average group. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted, wanted to probe a little bit on this because it would seem to suggest that what we have is that there are some sectors which are performing reasonably well, and I'm guessing that's going to be in in, in the primary care sector. Um, in, in particular, maybe. <laughs> uh, we don't know yet. But, and there are some sectors which may not be performing particularly well. This is the conversation we were starting to have yesterday about this. And if we're just trying to level everything up, are we in danger of losing the ability to point to the fact that a particular sector, if it happens to be adult social care, is not performing well across the board? if we're kind of pushing people into the out, outstanding by lowering the standard there. I don't quite, is it, or have I got the wrong end of the stick there? Because that, that, but, but by, by dropping it down in order to make sure we get people into the outstanding, are we, are we being disingenuous in some reason? I, well, I would argue if we've got some, somewhere where you, know, you should have the same standard across the whole lot rather than trying to push people up into an outstanding if it's not outstanding. So to be absolutely that this, this principle would apply to every one of our sectors. So it'd either be two outstandings equals overall outstanding across the board, or three across the board. There'd be no attempt to say it'd be 
in inverted commas, easier in adult social care or in hospitals than it would be in any other sector. And, and if I could, could also say that the, and it comes to the um, second point in the recommendations on page five, is that you, the judgment is being made against the characteristics of outstanding against each of the um, five, uh, five key questions. It's actually a very, very stretching judgment. Um, and I was speaking yesterday um, with an inspector who um, was involved in wave two, and, and she was um, frankly quite frustrated <laughs> by the kind of quality control mechanisms that we'd had which were really um, uh, questioning her judgment about some of the services that she did think were outstanding but um, you know we were uh, uh, the, 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 the panels were kind of saying well actually where do we have the evidence to prove that it's outstanding so the the ability for anybody to get even one outstanding on a grid is actually a you know, it is is um, is a pretty pretty stretching uh, target. So to get to to become overall outstanding and all of the other areas to be good, um, you know, is is I think um, uh, it is a significant stretch for us to ask. Um, and you know, we've only done it on small numbers up till now, uh, and it's not about you know trying to make sure that we have some outstandings because we would have some outstandings, but it is also about making sure that it's a credible and attainable thing so that people from good can see that they can push themselves to get to outstanding, which is you know our role in terms of encouraging improvement as well. Uh, thanks, David. The um I'd echo what uh, Andrea is saying for primary care, and we've been shadow rating. Um, and it's quite interesting that you can see in a in a number of uh, GP practices, Paul, that uh, there are is outstanding care. But uh, and the grid we will have, just like the one you've seen for the hospital inspections, uh, goes down into detail in each of those areas and each of the patient groups. So we quite are often finding. Uh, outstanding care or responsive um, provision of care in, say, one of those groups. But actually the practices at the moment are being let down by some basic problems in safety, uh, evidenced by um, the infection areas or, um, or medicines management is one of our key areas. So one of the messages I've been trying to get across to the GP community through our Mythbusters each week is You've got to do some of the basic stuff well, and then actually the outstanding characteristics can 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 really shine. Um, but it's that dichotomy in general medical practice where some of the basic systems aren't working, which is my worry. It's also in our discussions with the BMA on ratings. One of the issues they've been rising raising about the global overall rating of a practice and how they're more comfortable with the granular ratings in those particular cells. And I think we personally, I think we need both. Uh, but it does demonstrate to the patients the differences sometimes. And it will allow one of our key things is about quality improvement, encouraging quality improvement. It will help that. And we're already seeing big improvements in some of the basics uh, in the practices that have read our earlier reports on uh, how you make sure you monitor fridge temperatures and things like that. That is improving dramatically, evidenced by new fridges in some surgeries. Uh, some of them actually are not in wrappers as well, and, um, and uh, in date drugs. These are basic, but if you don't get the basics right, actually the whole care suffers for those groups of patients. Uh, I'd be a bit concerned that we are um, not um, uh, prepared to use outstanding enough. I mean, I th um, so we just have to make sure that that doesn't, you know, that on the one hand, we want the ratings to be sufficiently rigorous. So we've got to tell it like it is and not give the public an impression of services that they use, which they find not credible. On the other hand, for the purpose, uh, purpose of developing the sophistication of the ratings, we have to be able to use the full spectrum enough. Uh, and we have to uh, make people feel that they can get there. Now, I suppose the, the, uh, it's partly because it's a paper about how the ratings fit together. It looks slightly like the, the task is to get the right grid structure. Um, but are we saying somewhere, in other words, you have to get the right combination, and that's how you get outstanding. Um, but uh, have we said somewhere how w what outstanding would be based on? So that 
Um, sometimes when we talk about outstanding services, we talk about what they do, and then there's something inspirational about something we see. But that's quite difficult to specify and to define. Um, and the key will be, uh, uh, it's just at the moment it looks slightly sort of mechanical. You know, you get one of this and two of that, and you're outstanding. Uh, partly because it's a paper, not a, not the, it's not the thing in practice. But the, the key will be to making sure people understand what three things they will have to do to improve their practice enough. Otherwise, they will all settle for good on the grounds that's, that, tactically, that's the, that's the most efficient thing to do. Um, so yes, we, do, we, we set out what the characters for example, of outstanding are for each of the five key questions. Um, and it is things like the level of innovation, um, but and in, in leadership, particularly the way in which uh, the culture is, on, and, and safety isn't just something that's done because it has to be done, but it really lies at the heart of the way the practice is performed. Um, we have conversations about it. There's a test of would you travel 100 miles to see this place? Um, which is a way of conceptualising it, but we, the, the whole point of having the, each of the four ratings levels set out at the level of the key question is precisely to show people what it would require to be outstanding. And, and we use those um, descriptors a lot at the quality assurance group, so that if we're having a debate about is this good or is it outstanding, Usually it's a member of Paul's team who's uh, on the quality assurance group will have those uh, rating descriptors and we will ask them, just remind us exactly what the wording is, does that fit that, that characteristic? While we're on the inspections, it, it is this business of, of reminding teams that even to be good, you, you can have some areas that require improvement and r reminding uh, people about that and saying, actually, would you be happy to be treated here? And that's a pretty good metric for, for good. But outstanding is something beyond that. Um, is there something that others could learn from this place? Is, is there something that this can demonstrate? When we compile all our outstandings, which we can and will do in due course, when we've got a few more of them, um, th then, uh, you, you know, it's got to mean something to people in the outside world. Yes, my, my goodness, that's something that we're not doing. And having... Um, We've got some examples um, that are coming through where, where you, you know, when people have read the reports, they've said, my God, is that really happening? Um, and so I think, you know, we will see more of this. But I think with the, with the acute sector, do remember that our sample is skewed uh, towards those that are less likely to be outstanding. No, I understand that. If you mind just, just a very quick comment, David, that's OK. Um, I think it's good when we're giving people examples and using words which mean something, like innovation. At least that means that's, that's a sort of partial meaning word. Um, I don't think it's enough. To, uh, to be honest, I, I, if you say, would you travel 100 miles to see it, what does that mean? <laughs> um, if you say, would your friends and family use it, would you, uh, what does that mean? I, I don't think those are reliable bases on which we should be basing our inspection. We should be, we, th those are impressionistic colloquialisms. They're, they're, not, they're, not, they're not the basis of a serious judgment of a service. And uh, I'm sorry to be a bit negative today, but, the, but we, we, we've, got to, we've got to move to something that's rigorous, properly defined, and uh, you know, asking people their impressions, whether they would travel 100 miles, well, that might depend on whether there was a bus. You know, I mean, it's, that, that it honestly is a meaningless question in relation to the quality of healthcare. And, if we, and we, we've got to get beyond that into something which carries objective okay. fact. No, so I'll be category. It doesn't say in the handbook, <laughs> it, you know, 50 miles good, 100 miles. Th th that was uh, for the purposes of uh, exemplifying the, the point. The, the whole friends and family Test. Okay, that. All right. Well, we're, we're, we're definitely not designing the friends and family test. Yeah. Um, but the, there, there are rigorous uh, standards, if you like, set out for what outstanding is at the level of each key line of, uh, of each uh, key question. Okay. Um, Paul. Uh, um, <laughs> do you want to move on to requires improvement? My mother-in-law we... watches. Sorry, my mother-in-law watches. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, on the requires improvement, um, the, the point I just wanted to draw out there was that we'd, we've we've long had the principle uh, which we want to hold to that uh, two requires improvements uh, in a key uh, question would limit the overall rating to um, to uh, requires improvement. Um, but as we always have to, once we take those principles, we then have to say, well, how does that play out 
if it isn't for whatever, we're not judging across the key questions, but we're judging across the core services or population groups. Um, uh, so what would it mean if you didn't, weren't looking at two from five, but you were looking at two from eight or two from four? So to take the community services example on page four, um, what we were finding was that because we had said, well, if, if we've got two from five, that requires improvement. Um, we think that when you've got four or fewer, in this case, rows, for the four uh, core services and community health services, uh, we should have a principle that if you've got one requires improvement, that would limit it to requires improvement. That had been our proposal. But when we look at that particular grid, I think it highlights the problem that just uh, two requires improvements at the cell level uh, end up therefore driving an overall effective and overall responsive requires of improvement. And though that then gives you the two from five and means the overall, overall, if you like, is requires improvement. And that just does not feel right. Um, two out of 20 cell levels is just, just too hard uh, a test. So on that basis, we want to change the, um, uh, the number of underlying ratings as set out at the top of page five so that it would be one or more requires improvement uh, required if there were one to three core services, four to eight would be two or more, and nine plus three or more. Nine plus is important because in mental health services we have 11 core services, and in some combined providers we can have even more. I can ask Paul, this Paul over here, do you, I mean, just overall, do you feel that this is the right approach on ratings? Do you? Absolutely. I mean, the, uh, this um, is a, your thing, sorry. Well, this yeah. is a. Um, there's an echo to a previous career about 30 years ago, which is actually how you used to give degrees, how you do de give degrees. Um, and it's different in very different, it's different in different universities, but actually uh, it, there is a, in the end, there's a common sense about how, about both is it fair and are you going to have enough firsts or are you going to have enough outstandings. Um, uh, and all of these are exactly the way in which degrees are given, in that you're working out uh, how many papers you've got, how many you can do, uh, and coming to something which actually, if you're outside of it, thinks this is questionable, but actually inside of it and applying the judgments, these are, these are the sorts of characteristics about the way in which everybody in this country does or does not get a degree. Good. Are we, can, we, can we accept these recommendations? Of all? No. <laughs> So I'm, this is a different point. I, I do apologise, but it was, it's really about the outstanding. And it is, a, it is a very important thing that we talked about at previous meetings, um, and that is the place for, of care for people with dementia and learning disability. Um, and just to briefly remind you of the history, I was very keen that we, uh, that you, as an acute trust, so this is not a mental health, as an acute trust, you could not get an outstanding rating unless you could demonstrate that you had done you had provided satisfactory, that means equivalent care, for uh, people who are at the, the, on the, at the sort of bottom of the uh, pyramid for, uh, for, for, in the health and social care system. So people with learning disability, people with dementia. So you had to be, you'd have to be able to show how you made sure their care, their access to acute physical health care was as good as for other people. And uh, the, I think at a previous discussion, we, uh, slightly to my disappointment, uh, decided that would not be uh, um, a, in the system. Um, but it was a question of, uh, of that kind was then included in the handbook consultation. Now, it, it doesn't appear, you mentioned the Mental Capacity Act issue, but that is a slightly, that's a, it's related, but it's not the same issue. And I just wonder where we've got to with that, because uh, just to make one final point, I, uh, there, there is a, a question still for me about whether these ratings are trying to be a sort of accurate impression of the system, like a sort of tracing that you do as a child, on so you get, end up with an accurate picture or whether we're not just trying to get accuracy here, but to drive improvement in the system and to drive a set of values which will change healthcare. And that's the kind of question, it seems to me, about people with dementia, people with learning disability, that drive improvement and make an acute trust think, well, yes, what we do may be good, it may even be outstanding, um, but actually here's an area which represents a set of values for the healthcare system which we are not very good on. And that would make something concrete of it. Now, you haven't mentioned it, but uh, I mean, is, this, is it somewhere in the system that what happens on that point? Public discussions at the end of the meeting. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, so I, I can think of at least two places in the handbook that it that does come up. So in the responsive key lines of inquiry, um, 
one of the, the Chloe's is about responsiveness to uh, groups with different needs. So there's an expectation that people would look at, therefore, um, well, I, hope, well I, won't, I won't go through them, but obviously different, different groups who would go through a hospital. Um, and the other part is that we say that in the course of our inspections, we may well look at, I think we do phrase it in terms of may well look rather than categorically say we will, um, particular groups, those with learning disability, those with dementia, those with diabetes, um, those with mental health conditions. And I think that was in line with the, the board discussion. So we, we do, as you say, Louise, we don't go as far as to say this will categorically form part of the ratings judgment in terms of a key line inquiry or above, but we do say we will take it into account. I, I can assure you that both dementia and learning disabilities uh, are now featuring, I think, in every report, um, uh, and th they are they form a very important uh, component of the responsiveness domain. Um, and we, we always ask them. In fact, there's a trust that went through the National Quality Assurance Group not <coughs> very long ago, where we've referred it back because there was no mention of of, of learning disabilities. And we said, you know, can we go back and check was learning disabilities asked about uh, dur during the um, inspection? There was information on dementia, by the way, in, in that same report. And so we are. By the time the report um, goes out, we will have evidence about both learning disabilities uh, and. Um, dementia. What I don't, th we're asking that at the core service level within other responsive uh, domain. I don't think we are yet aggregating that. To trust level well enough, but that is something again that is on our agenda to do, so that there would be a statement about overall dementia care and overall learning disabilities care uh, in the responsiveness domain in the provider level report. So that that is certainly what we are aiming for. Thanks. Just just to add one in primary in, in general practice, um, as you know, Lewis. Uh, I've been an advocate with Sheila Hollins and others for years about people with learning disabilities and as a marker for, for good care and how th these people who are equally as human as I am, uh, how they get care in general practice uh, and have been, have been at odds with people over the years in promoting that. And so what we've done for our vulnerable group section, which includes people with learning disabilities for that reason, we will in every practice ask them to demonstrate that they have a register of people with learning disabilities and also the care that they're providing. So it's a positive set of prompts. Uh, and also we've added dementia to the population group uh, uh, of people with mental health issues. So that it doesn't get lost in just the elderly care area that we specifically focus on those two groups of people in primary care. As we start to move, as Andrea mentioned earlier on, to more joined up looking at care pathways and the care focused on the individual, we will also start to look at those sort of issues across between social care, hospital care and general practice. Can we agree these recommendations that Paul has on page five? Yeah. Okay, please. Paul, you must really have to press on. Please. Yes. Um, and I should have said at the beginning that this is Thanks for an awful lot of people's work. David mentioned it in the policy and strategy team in particular, but right across CQC. Um, the final recommendation block um, is around inspection frequency, and we wanted to draw attention to the fact that in adult social care, um, we are proposing, uh, subject to, to resources, um, that there is a comprehensive inspection at least every two years uh, for all locations. Um, and we think that is particularly important given the relative paucity of data in that sector. Um, the uh, paragraph three at the top of page six then lays out um, how that would break down according to the uh, ratings judgments uh, as we go around them. Obviously, we would um, wish to be back sooner for um, a care home provider uh, that was inadequate rather than domiciliary care provider that was seen as outstanding. Um, and that we will also do a number of random inspections each year of good and outstanding services. Um, for the other sectors, we are less specific on exactly how those categories go, um, but the principle is a minimum inspection frequency of three years. Um, is everyone happy with that? Yeah. OK. Camilla? Um, you say subject to resources. Could you just explain what you mean? 
uh, if the Department of Health were to say that we needed to take a substantial uh, budget reduction in 2015-16, then we wouldn't be able to resource at the same time, because so we wouldn't have as many inspectors. Sorry, but you're saying we have the resources at the moment to do this frequency? Uh, yes, we only have a budget for 14-15. We don't have one set out for the years to come. So is it realistic for us to make this proposition? Yes, it is, and we're, and we're making the case strongly to the department, and we think we'll secure the money, we think we've got the case, but we have to say subject to resources because we don't have a settlement. Michael? Yes, I think my, my question on this is... Um, It'd be very helpful to have evidence that says if a hospital or a care home is outstanding, one can expect that it will stay outstanding for two to three years, that there's not some, you know, that it's uh, the risk of uh, degradation in the quality provided um, is, you know, is not such that the life of the rating is less or significantly less than the frequency of inspection. And I just don't know whether there's evidence for that. I mean, it would just be very helpful to know that, you know, we can only inspect every two years or three years because uh, somebody's outstanding, you know, 90% of the time stays outstanding for that period of time. But, you know, so this is a question of is there any proof one way or the other because I think that is probably you know, should be the key determinant of frequency is the, you know, uh, time in which providers um, maintain quality at whatever, I mean, obviously this is different for requires improvement or inadequate, but for people we rate as good or outstanding, you know, is it the case that we can expect them to be good or outstanding for the next two years? Or? So I, th I think this is why Lewis's first comment was so important about we've got to keep on going and do our strategy. At the moment, nobody knows the answer to that question because nobody has ever done a comprehensive assessment to know who's outstanding or who isn't sector by sector. Um, but we, are, we will absolutely then build up that knowledge and as we see variation or degradation, then we can change our frequency. The other point I think is important is the um, we will get information on an ongoing basis, particularly if there are concerns, and we build up this intelligence-driven approach. So if we find, we hear concerns that warrant a focused in inspection, we absolutely won't wait for the three years to become expired, we'll go in. And I think, I, I think the challenge that you, you, you pose, Michael, is a good one, and is one that we, we actually have a contribution to make to that evidence base in terms of building that up. Um, and, and I think that there's um, two or three things that will help us to that. What we find when we go back um, and, and what the trajectory is, exactly as, as Paul has said, we will have information um, coming through to us, and there is... Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I'm not going to be complacent about this because there are still um, uh, uh, concerns in some quarters, but people are more confident about sharing with us their concerns about ser services um, so that we can pick that up uh, and therefore, uh, therefore go back. Um, the information, you know, our data um, that allows us to assess risk um, in adult social care is nowhere near as developed as, as, as Mike has, but there are a couple of things that really do um, uh, uh, help us. One is frequency of changes of the registered manager, or indeed change of the registered manager, um, and the other is um, unexpected death notifications. Um, and both of those things come through to us, and one of the things that we absolutely learned from the ORCID view, um, uh, review was not to allow the halo effect of a good or outstanding um, uh, assessment of a service, or as we previously um, described it uh, in the old regime, um, to, um, to, to, to allow people to think, oh, well, it's an outstanding service and actually those things have happened and it's all right. Actually, I think we are much more attuned to picking up on those risks. So it's, it's something that we will build up over time. OK, thank you very much. Um... Paul, could you thank your team for the work they've done on these provider handbooks? Or the key, you know, they've done a really remarkably good job. So, would you thank them very much and stimulated a, a long discussion? <laughs> I will.
Um, I think we've finished the paper, haven't we, really? The rest of it is for noting. The rest of it is for noting, that's yeah. right. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Right, I think we must press on um, rather than stopping for coffee because I know other people at the end want to ask questions. So, um, uh, David Values. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so this is the culmination of uh, quite an extensive piece of work which has gone on over the spring and the summer. Uh, it's been to the board on a couple of occasions and um, you've uh, made comment on it and asked us to go back and do further work on it. So this is... Thank you. Do I have to say all that again? Uh, this is the culmination of a lot of work which has gone on over the spring and the summer and um, it's previously been to the board and you've asked us to take it away and do further work in relation to shortening the approach. Uh, a number of board colleagues have helped with this and provided examples from other organisations, uh, suggestions about how we might approach this, think about it, present it. And there's been a pretty extensive uh, engagement across the organisation with uh, the staff that work in the organisation. So there's been a mixture, if I can use this rather um, reductionist language, of bottom-up and uh, top-down uh, engagement with this um, approach. So what you've got in front of you, at the last meeting you asked uh, 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 the executive team, you asked me to go away and bring back a report which made recommendations to you about what the values of the organisation should be. So this report is presented today with the view that you uh, agree uh, what's set out here. And if I just may take a brief moment, David, just to uh, draw out what it is that we're uh, asking you to agree and say more about this. Um, if I could go to the uh, PowerPoint slides uh, 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 that are attached as an annex. We've begun with a statement of purpose because this is now pretty well embedded with our stakeholders and our staff. And the sign up to this, and this was borne out again in the staff survey, is pretty comprehensive. We've then gone to lay out, and this was uh, the next slide is a four box uh, grid about the values, what's important to us. And the purpose of this uh, particular slide um, was to go beyond the thing that you challenged us on last time, which is to move away from one word statements of values. Um, and what we propose is that the approach that we take is to use this grid uh, as a way of stating our values. If I just take the excellence uh, quadrant in the top left hand corner, what we've tried to do there is define what we mean by excellence. We've attempted to look inside the organisation internally what excellence means for the organisation and externally that this means excellence in the way that people receive services. At the end of that quadrant uh, is our letters in red, which uh, refers to a high-performing organisation. Uh, if we were to abbreviate that quadrant, it will be excellence um, hyphen a high-performing organisation, caring hyphen to treat everyone with dignity and respect. If I can ask you to go over, not to the next slide, but the one after that, our values, where they came from. Uh, um, what we've attempted to do here, again, if we can just draw your eyes to the top left-hand uh, corner of this slide, is uh, we've taken the 30-odd words which uh, continue to repeat uh, through the consultations, through the conversations, and assemble them in a word cloud to actually uh, link and demonstrate what is subsumed under the use of the word excellence and then the words that follow in that uh, narrative in the uh, four box quadrant, uh, what is important to us. So in a sense, if this was the, I did all level maths and uh, when you did that, you got to submit your workings out as well as your answer. Uh, this is the working out as well as the answer, if you wish. These are the words that inform that. I don't know that we're proposing that we would use this um, publicly, but is used today to show uh, where those um, four, uh, four, four box, boxes come from on the previous slide. The other thing that we would uh, uh, propose to use, uh, David and colleagues, 
is um, our values brought to life. Uh, Michael kindly did uh, a huge amount of research on how other organisations have uh, uh, approached this issue of values. And in uh, some of those, there was one organisation which had used a similar way of presenting, uh, bringing these values to life. So with uh, uh, no apology for plagiarism, um, I think as an executive team, we all liked this presentation because they were moving into uh, beginning to describe not a sequence of words, but what they mean for what we need to do. And it's the behaviours that I think we're reaching for here rather than a simple description of words. So this is then presented on taking the um, value of excellence and high performance excellence for ourselves and others uh, to make an I statement of, in my work for CQC, I, and then begin to describe what the behaviours are that we want to see. So the three key slides uh, here, uh, David and colleagues, is the statement of purpose, the slide our values, what is important to us, the four box grid, and then the values brought to life. These are the, these are the documents we'd prepare uh, propose that we use and begin to pass into uh, the way we take them forward. The cover report, I think, flags how we intend to use them in terms of our recruitment literature, uh, some of our training and development courses, etc. Again, the slide, what next? Um, if um, you're uh, in agreement with what's proposed to you this morning, then these will be launched on the 1st of October. Um, we'd uh, uh, have a theme for November being Values Month, and uh, we'd then do um, packs to support the launch of this through our managers, uh, providing staff with support materials, and generally beginning to uh, socialise these values into the organisation, into our literature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that the next stage of how we embed them in uh, the way that we operate. Um, becomes clear. Um, I think the report has slightly more detail on what the next steps are and uh, how we will measure success uh, as part of this and then begin to embed this in the staff survey that we touched on earlier. So in subsequent staff surveys, we are testing how these are taken forward. Um, I know that um, since these papers went out, some colleagues have made suggestions uh, around this um, Certainly, uh, Robert, has sent, Robert Francis has sent some comments in, and um, one of his reflections is whether the word independence features uh, sufficiently well. So I think there's just a last bit of finessing to do with these to make sure that these are aligned with uh, the previous publications and the approach that we're taking. Uh, so they're presented in uh, that spirit, David. This is a, an extensive piece of work. They're presented to ask you for agreement um, uh, with the notion that as we just take this to finalisation, uh, we may polish the odd phrase to make sure that they're fully aligned with uh, what we uh, want to take forward. But um, I hope that gives you a sense of why it's here, the journey it's been on, and what we're asking you to agree. Thank you. OK. Yeah. Th thanks, David, and for talking around it. I mean, I actually, um, I think this is really, really good. I think it's fab. Um, it, I think it's, it's good in the sense of what the end product, but also how we've got to the end product. Yes, there might be some finesse, but I think that um, it reflects really well on the organisation. As I say, it's how we've got to the point as well as the, the end product. And my other point is um, as a challenge, actually, to um, David as chair, um, um, to make sure that we, um, as a board, live and embody these values. So we've got to sort of lead by example and demonstrate. I'm sure we can do it, mm. but uh, that's my challenge to you. Fair enough. Thank you, Kay. Anyone else like to make any comments? Um, well, look, it's, it has been... A lot of people have been involved in this process, David. I think there's a, a big commitment to these values um, in terms of how you present them, and there may be a little bit of finessing to do around that. But I think, I think the board absolutely endorses these, these fundamental values. And I think, actually, in, in part answer to, to Kay's question, I think that the way... 
David leads this organization. I mean, he is regarded very much as an authentic leader of this organization and does embody all these values, I think. And I think the, the weekly note that goes out to all staff is, is part of that. So, um, uh, and then we had a good discussion at the board last time on this as well. So I think we're all very much in favor, David. So well done, thank you. Uh, Paul, this is quick, a quick one, I think. I think that's right. Um, so the uh, National Information Governance Committee is a statutory uh, requirement on, uh, for CQC, um, as is set out in the paper. Um, it's been uh, in operation for a little over a year now and will be um, carrying on at least till uh, March 2015, just to give a, a sense of it. Um, I chair that um, now that Steve has left the board. Um, and the, with, with uh, sort of between gratitude to the uh, to all the members of, the, of that committee, uh, they've spent a lot of time looking through the handbooks um, in preparing the interim report that you've got, you've got today. Uh, there are three main recommendations, and we've touched on a number of them uh, as part of the provider handbooks discussion. So those three uh, simply are: one is to have that key line of inquiry that I discussed. Um, focused on, specifically on information to give that greater prominence. Second is to ensure that the um, information is captured um, at the key line of inquiry level on a consistent basis. And the third is that there's a good evidence um, management system that then sort of holds that across all providers and allows good analysis to be done so that we really know what's going on uh, within CQC. Um, those are the overriding um, recommendations. There's also an analysis uh, from um, a small uh, selection of hospitals, community health services, mental health and out-of-hours uh, reports, uh, which is mentioned on page three of the, um, of the report, uh, which shows um, what we know so far about the quality of information governance in, um, across our provider sectors. But it comes with a heavy caveat that obviously we're just um, testing most of our um, assessments at that stage, and there's a limit to how much... Um, insight can be drawn from them. So I think the, rec uh, the committee has therefore rightly focused its recommendations on how we can improve our assessment frameworks, and that's strongly um, influenced the proposals we brought to you on the provider handbooks. Um, thanks, Paul. And any questions for Paul on that? Camilla? Sorry, I, I, very quick question. Maybe I haven't understood this properly. Um, are we clear that we're, when we're asking for information, we're asking for meaningful information? just because we don't want to create a counterproductive situation where people are rushing around and creating information. You see what I mean? I'm slightly concerned about, I mean, I'm always concerned about the burden we put on providers anyway, but we don't want mountains of uh, meaningless information. Um, <laughs> so so, so this, this came out, I think, in Kieran's report as well, this, this sort of sense that when we'd started out in our desire to want to know, we'd ask for a lot of stuff. I think there was about 500 documents. Um, and now, for example, in the handbooks, we, we're going to be much clearer that we want specific information um, and turning that round, as, as Michael drew out, into you tell us about the quality of care is exactly where we want to go. We do reserve the right to ask for information, obviously. And then the really key point is um, that uh, provider boards and um, people, uh, run the, uh, the organisations uh, are candid with us. So if they know of a problem, they need to tell us. But we're getting, I think, a lot better at not just asking for the ocean. OK. Yeah, I mean, it's very important. We always bear that in mind. It's the burden we put on others as well as ourselves, isn't it? Um, thanks, Paul. Then lastly, um, National Survey Programme. Oh. Um, so the board is asked to, uh, to endorse this proposal. It's for uh, a three-year pr um, uh, programme of survey work. Uh, we run a lot of national surveys as the paper sets out, um, six at the moment and about to generate a seventh. Um, and what we've had to do in this uh, proposal is bal effectively balance two things. On the one hand, we absolutely need to keep the survey programme going. It's an incredibly rich source of data um, that, as, as uh, Mike was mentioning, feeds into predominantly the, the hospitals in Spectra, but not entirely. Um, but at the same time, we know that the world is changing and changing quite rapidly as regards qualitative feedback. Um, so we don't want to be hidebound by a, uh, a rigid procurement that only means we can do certain things. So the proposal has been to, uh, is to procure 
the survey program for the next three years, but to do so in a way that maintains sort of the maximum flexibility. And rather than that just being something which we look at in isolation, um, what would we sort of like to do on surveys, to embed that in the work of the knowledge and information strategy so that it's looking at why would we want surveys versus a friends and family test or any other form of, um, of feedback that we might receive uh, and to particularly fill the gaps in the knowledge that we have. Uh, and of course, the gaps are particularly severe in the adult social care uh, world. So um, that's a proposal. It's for 2.5 million uh, pre-VAT, 3 million after VAT. That's a small uplift um, on the 2.2 million pre-VAT uh, for the last three years, um, and that reflects that we're doing more surveys than we were. The only thing I would mention is that NHS England also have their, uh, run some other surveys, like the uh, general practice uh, patient survey, which is a bigger single survey, um, and we are in discussion with them um, about what their forward programme of work is like. Come on. Sorry, thank you, because we, we, we did discuss that before the, the GP survey. Can we just agree that we're not going to tender this contract until we have an agreement with NHS England about what it is our, I mean, so that we are actually coordinating our work? I can see a situation in two years' time where we've still got different quangos, you know, asking for different things. Um, do you mean as in, to say we should, we should have one organisation doing all the surveys? No, I thought you were implying, rightly, that it was important for us to understand what their programme of work was so that it's coordinated. I, I mean, I'd rather have one organisation doing it all, but as somebody recommended, I can't remember what it was. Um, but, I mean, if, if not, then we just need to... Yeah, it's just, it's, just an, it's just an efficiency point, you know. No, point So we'll make sure we're not procuring something they're already procuring, to put it in those terms, or vice versa. Yeah, or stuff that's complementary. Yes, no, that, that, that work is ongoing. We'll give you assurance on that. Oh, Lewis. Uh, is this a, um, a chance to reconsider how some of the surveys are um, carried out to make sure that they're... So it's, it's more than a re-procurement. It's a, a rethink of what their place is, is in the system, how we uh, conduct them. Um, the ones I know best are the ones in, in uh, mental health, and they're not bad. Uh, but um, sometimes the questions have been... Uh, have seemed a little sort of crude, um, and the way that the answers have been dealt with have also seemed uh, you know, um, open to challenge uh, the way that people answering questions in different ways then have their answers lumped together so that they become the same way. And um, that, that really is an insensitive way of going about it. Um, uh, I mean, if you're going to do that, then don't ask, you know, don't offer people options which you then just combine. Yeah, re um, really important that we, we do do it in that way. I mean, the one big question is, is three years actually a valid um, cycle time, uh, because things can be so out of date by year three. So we'll be looking at, at, uh, at the frequency. We'll also be looking at the questions. Uh, obviously, we want to have some consistency over years, and we will need to go through the costs, implications of changing frequency. But just very quickly, I think but frequency yeah. is an, it's a very important point, but it is also about methods, you know, the, the, the role of online methods, the what steps are taken to reach people who don't otherwise take part in surveys, that kind of thing. Um, and then the sensitivity to change. I mean, that's one of the things people say about surveys is you do them every two years or whatever it is, um, and they just show the same thing again. Now, you could say that's because the system isn't responding very well, um, but it may be that the questionnaires are not very sensitive to what people actually think. Um, so so uh, it's just a, a, a question about rethinking what in a more comprehensive way. I completely go al al along with that, uh, Lewis, and certainly I know it's my area that at the moment is the main beneficiary of this, the, the, these surveys, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, whether it's the community mental health survey or whether it's the ones that apply to the acute sector. But I think this, this point about the frequency is a very important one because, frankly, if an A&E survey was done in uh, 2011, it really isn't... Uh, a, germane to our inspections now. So I think looking at what is the interval that we can still reliably say that that should inform our judgment uh, is an important one. Whereas the maternity survey, which has been only published a few months back, it clearly is informing our judgments uh, on maternity as a core service. So I think it's about how we do it, but how often we do it uh, that matters. All right, Paul. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, questions from the floor? Yeah, David. David Hogarth. Um, 
I went down to Penzance uh, for my holiday and I started reading the guidance, this enormous document, the guidance for providers on meeting the fundamental standards at Paddington. I was still reading uh, when I crossed the Tamar Bridge. Um, and I, I, I must say, I felt a sort of sense of, well, I, th I thank God I wasn't a provider myself. I thought of the despair and looking at all these things that providers could do. And I wondered if there's any chance of it being shortened and shortened in a particular way to take out the one thing which seems to me, and I don't know whether the board agrees about this, which is really important is, does the service really want to make its users happy? Um, that seems to me to be absolutely crucial thing and that all the other things will to some extent fall in your lap because if they want to make the things happy then they will care about being safe then they will care about being stimulating then they will care about everything else and you will be more friendly advisors than inspectors so that was why one thought i was also slightly influenced by having read this report which i suspect camilla will know well the roundtree report on excessive paperwork uh, undermining does it undermine the care for older people came out in february and they came out to the conclusion, yes, that it did, and that the CQC had quite a lot of responsibility for that. Are you going to do anything to reduce the amount of paperwork that providers have to do so they can get out and do the leading which you are inspecting for? Um, I'd just finally like to say that about the provider handbooks, um, the, a small voice saying, do you really want so much consistency? Because the more inconsistency that you have, the more worried the providers will be and the more effective your inspection will be, the better the quality will be at the, at the end of it all. And I'd finally like to say thank, I always feel slightly as a gate crasher coming to these meetings, although I've been coming for a year and a half, I, I feel that, you know, some, some I, I like, I'd like to thank you and I think we would all like to thank you for uh, welcoming us to the party uh, and being quite friendly and smiling at us when we come. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you're always welcome to come, as you know. Put on, on the length of the document, do you just want to um, comment on that? Your document. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it, it, it's, it's the board's. Um, uh, so, very good. Um, just so people know, that, that's the um, draft out for consultation on the enforcement policy and the guidance about registration uh, regulations. Um, the consultation is live at the moment, David, so we need to hear back from what everybody says. Um, what I would say is that at least some providers I'm, I'm hearing uh, are saying, is this enough? Because they want to know what they want to do. So I'm sure we'll have a, uh, a series of different views. And I take your point about making people happy, but because the guidance is specifically about the fundamental standards, the legal requirements, I think we do need to set out, and we're required to by law, the detail of, our, of, um, uh, of what's in them and the, and the implications for providers. Um, in... In terms of the burdens, I think the single biggest thing we can do is move more things online. Um, uh, when we have a programme of online services roll out, we know that helps, for example, um, our providers register and have a lower rejection rate. So I think that's one concrete example that we can do to reduce the burden on the sector. Okay. We'll have some of it altogether. Uh, oh, we couldn't get rid of it, some of it altogether. Do you mean which sectors we provide? Well, uh, we regulate. All these returns online or on paper that's still a burden? Uh, for, for what, yes, I can, I can see how they are a burden, but if they're necessary uh, for us doing our regulatory duty, then no, I don't think we can get rid of them. But we, there is an onus on us to make them as least burdensome as possible. David, uh, it's a really good challenge you're making to the, to the board, I think. Uh, we need to note it very carefully and, and be very sceptical about you know, the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy that we're producing. So it's a, good, it's a point well made. So and, thank you. And, and just one thing to say, one of the things that we've been doing from an adult social care point of view with the provider information return is actually to try and reduce the burden, although it's a kind of return that we're asking for, it actually sort of um, helps to bring things all together in one place at one time and stops this kind of, you know, to in and fro in that sometimes happens between um, inspectors and providers. So, you know, I'm... There's always things that we can do better, David, um, uh, but that's one of the things that we are trying to do to try and improve that um, in terms of the uh, relationship. 
another question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Noel Finn. Um, I'm a whistleblower. I'm a carer. I'm also um, a service user in the NHS and the private sector. Um, a question for Michael, please, uh, in relation to the um, the relationship between uh, Her Majesty's Inspectors of Prisons and um, also the CQC seems to be a huge gap, um, and also the services that are available within the uh, detention centres and the um, prison services seem to be lacking in regards to care and quality. Uh, could you assure me, that, or assure the public, that uh, there's more being done for this? Um, uh, Steve is actually Steve, okay. responsible Thank for you. this area. Can I hand it to him? Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I, I welcome a question on something other than general practice, um, because uh, I think most of the, the time we're doing, uh, our thoughts are about delivery general practice. But this whole um, health and justice sector is really important to me personally with a, a with a sort of back history looking at vulnerable groups and people in and out of secure environments as well as the staff so uh, what i did when i took over uh, as you might recall from the board papers is that we looked at this area and we've actually increased our team for health and justice uh, it's led by one of my deputies sue mcmillan and we've had a succession of meetings with um, Her Majesty's inspectorates of uh, prisons, probation, etc., as well as Ofsted looking at um, some of the, the child safeguarding areas. Um, we have in draft form a signposting document for, uh, I'd use the word revolutionising, but you know, you, it's probably inappropriate, I improving dramatically the um, inspection uh, which includes the intelligent monitoring of secure environments which includes prisons but places like Yarlswood uh, as well which I know I think from your point of view is a, a particular issue. Uh, we have excellent relationships with HMI prisons and probation. Um, I met with them personally um, within the last two months where we started scoping out for this signpost in document new ways of jointly inspecting all of those secure environments. Um, the thoughts at the moment include um, taking uh, the mental health issues very seriously as well as the general medical services provided in those institutions uh, and looking at how we're doing GP inspections and including, for example, GPs on all of those inspections and other relevant specialists which includes working very closely with uh, Mike's mental health team led by Paul Elliott. The time scale is that the, uh, you know, I have a draft here on my iPad. Um, we will be looking to launch this towards the end of October when we've internally got things as good as they could be. Um, and the new model should be working um, from April uh, 2015. The discussions with um, the uh, Chief Inspector for Prisons uh, have been hugely constructive. Uh, they already do week-long holistic inspections. It's how we add value and work as a single team on those inspections. Um, so if you want to uh, add to that consultation, it will be public and you'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. Um, so you don't need um, special clearance to do from the CQC. You don't need uh, special clearance through the Home Office to do assessments. Is that correct? You mean inspections? We, we're working well, well, hand the CQ, in glove with the CQC. I mean, I, I had a meeting um, previous two meetings with uh, two members of the CQC, and one of the questions came out of that was that uh, you need special clearance to go into detention centres. I just want some clarity on that. Do you need special clearance from the CQC? to do an assessment in detention centres. So I, I, I'm aware that you met with uh, Fergus, one of our team, and... and I the met with two colleagues. Yeah, the feedback to me was a very helpful meeting. Um, the our whole idea of this is working in partnership with uh, our colleagues in the uh, Inspectorate for Prisons and Secure Environments. Issues like that are things that need clarifying before we start in April. Uh, we don't rule anything in or out on it, and... Um, we are incredibly optimistic, but this is a genuine consultation and we need those issues raising. Okay, so you're going to be looking at regards to the special clearance issue with, from the Home Office. Um, you're going to be looking at the, the issue with the Home Office, um, asking for special clearance for CQC to go in and do assessments. 
Is that, uh, is that going to be covered in the discussion? This is an open consultation and we're not okay. taking anything in or taking anything out of it. And if that's raised by you or by the Home Office, then right. that's absolutely fine. But the meetings we've had so far have been hugely constructive and the relationships are excellent. I would disagree. I think there's a slight, there's a slight detachment between the Home Office and the CQC in regards to ensuring quality of care within detention centres and prison services. And I know you're going to work on that, but we are have got people in detention centres and prisons that are actually very vulnerable at this time that we speak and they're subject to self-harming suicidal ideation. So I understand there's a time frame to that and I accept that, but it's something that needs to be taken on board in your discussions. Can uh, I just the, ask one question? Okay, well, sorry, the, the final thing I'll say on, on that is that um, we are already in the middle of, um, or towards the end of a model where um, we have a responsibility and we're working with HMI prisons. We, we covered that in our last meeting. The relationships with the inspectorate are excellent. They, of course, have their own relationship um, issues, uh, as we do with our Department of Health, uh, they do with their uh, Home Office colleagues. Okay. Uh, that's a statement of, of fact. Uh, I won't make any pejorative statement on how well or badly or challenging these are relationships. And uh, what we want is a joint model from April. And the indications are so far that we've got um, absolute complete cooperation and support. And it's enhancing what we're doing uh, rather than anything else. I've just got three more and, I'm, and I'll finish on that, OK? Uh, it was, the next question is from Mike in relation to staff. Um, being filtered over from the NHS into CQC to provide extra support and experience and expertise in regards to assessments. Is there a concern that you're taking staff from a very, very vulnerable uh, environment, the NHS, into the CQC to plug that hole when there'll be a leaking hole in the NHS with staffing? The point that you made earlier on about reinforcing your, your analysis and expertise and doing your assessments? Your suggestion was the staff can be seconded over from the NHS. What I'm concerned about is there's already a leaking staffing issue in the NHS. If you're bringing them over to CQC, you're going to have further problems in the NHS. Shall I take that one? Thank you. Um, I think we do have to remember the 1.3 million people working in the NHS. Um, and, and as I said, we're looking in the first instance for perhaps 200 people. Now, I realise that we're, we're looking for 200 very specific people. I do also believe that in the um, medium term, this is highly to the advantage of driving up quality in the NHS. I think if people, as, as a mid-career step, come to us for, let's say, two years, um, they will get the experience of how we assess quality and safety. They will see uh, a large number of different hospitals and how they're doing it. I think that will be extremely valuable to them uh, I, in, in going back in, if they want, for example, if they've been a ward sister and they're wanting to move up a managerial ladder, I, I believe that will be a, an enormously beneficial. So, uh, yes, uh, in, a, in a very small sense, considering the, the numbers that are being recruited to the, the NHS overall, I think this is, this is small. But we're not only looking for that group. Um, and David uh, mentioned earlier on uh, the, the, the prospect of, of us looking for people who want to work term time only. Now, that may be a group of people who have moved out of the, the NHS and who um, would like to come and work in an area where that term time work only is possible. So we might be uh, not actually depleting the NHS at all, but getting people back into the workforce who are not currently working. The last, last question is regards to the Francis review. Um, just the, the Francis CQ review, just to make it clear, it's just a review. Um, so. Th it's not going to be, there's not going to be bite, any bite coming from that review. There'll be just a lot of talking. And uh, the suggestion of a, a public inquiry has got a bit more um, uh, bite to it in regards to ensuring about whistleblowing and safety in, within the, the health sector. And, yes. Uh, thank you. I would like to uh, endorse what David said to begin with about the um, helpful way in which the board does accept questions from members of the public. Um, I have two questions uh, briefly. Uh, one relates to um, an innovation which I think is taking place um, probably at, at the level of CCGs who are procuring 
services um, locally. Uh, for example, in Hearts Valleys, uh, there is a respiratory service uh, procured and a commission to start in October. This is cons uh, consultant physician-led uh, clinics locally in hospitals. Who will inspect that type of service, which seems to lie between primary and secondary care? Um, it really depends on what sort of service it is and where the registration is for that service. If it's outreach at the moment, um, we are doing a review of registration at the moment. And it's a very, very good question because in other areas there are new entities being formed to look at um, integrated care provision. That's in my uh, Ballywick. Um, we're already uh, looking at, for example, um, the integration of uh, urgent care services for people, which includes 111, urgent care centres, linking to Mike with A&E and GP in and out of hours. Uh, we're doing some work with Ofsted on children's services and safeguarding in that way. And we're about to appoint an advisor to look at uh, elderly care services, some of which are provided uh, actually from a residential point of view in, in, in care homes. And uh, it then depends, some GPs go and have beds in care homes, which some might call cottage hospitals in some areas. And sometimes it's the consultants coming out. and so. I think uh, one of the challenges from Lewis earlier on was around um, if we lock down the current model, what flexibility we have um, to, to develop that. And I think Anna raised it as well. That's exactly the work my team are doing. Uh, they are now in post and uh, raring to go. Thank you. There may, in some cases, I think, be relatively little patient choice associated with these new styles of service. Um, the second question, I. I return to, I think, a question I asked some months ago in relation to Ofsted and the CQC, having had a background myself with Ofsted, um, and listening to the discussions this morning, Ofsted have sailed this, these stormy waters for a number of years, uh, and issues like hard data, um, uh, training and accreditation of inspectors, which in their case is followed by an examination, uh, and a whole series of other development of handbooks. Are there still ongoing meetings between CQC and Ofsted? Because it would seem from the perspective of a member of the public, that there could be a lot to be learned. We have had a number of meetings with Ofsted over the last year, um, and they've been very useful, actually, because there's a lot of similarities between what Ofsted are doing and what we're doing. So there is a, there is a good, close working relationship there. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I think we'll break for coffee now. Thank you.